Welcome to the 98th episode of the Nerdum and Other Nonsense Anime Podcast. Today, we'll be breaking down anime that aired during the 11th week of the spring 2019 season. As always, we have timestamps in the description of the YouTube video and the podcast feed if you only want to hear about one or two specific shows, since we're going to be spoiling literally everything, especially this late in the season. My name is Becom, and last weekend, I dressed up as an M&M and ran through the store yelling, The Skittles are coming! The Skittles are coming! <laughs> also with me are Kat and Leo. <laughs> it would be That's amazing up. if you actually did that. And second of all, Leo, I demand to know what the fuck that is referenced to, because you made that. <laughs> it's, I, it's nothing. That's just Leo's pure brain No, no, thoughts. no. It, it, it doesn't just come from nothing. Did you dream about this? In the <laughs> no, dream, it, were you the fucking... Person it just, it, dressed I think up it was as on a list. M&M? Well, it's I think like it was on the a British, list. The British are coming. The British are coming. Yeah. I, mean, I think it was just on a list of like ridiculous things to say. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that one's pretty funny. Okay. <laughs> uh. Leo's just using lists now to come up with these. <laughs> I, could, great. I couldn't come up with he, anything this week. He I is nothing the stood out to me. Of our fucking podcast. He always has the list, right? This is true. Very oh. organized. All right, so uh, let's get into some nonsense that happened this week. Uh, I was trying to think. I've watched like a bunch of different things, but the one that stood out is I finally finished the first season of Sailor Moon, uh, which I've been watching for a while, all 46 episodes of it. (laughs) Oh, God, the opening is so good. Um, I really enjoyed Sailor Moon a lot. It is very much a 90s show. It is very much like Monster of the Week as like Usagi and her friends as like she starts gathering more Sailor Scouts together uh, fight off these like evil monsters and like their diabolical plans and stuff. And it's all kind of like fun in games uh, until the very end of the show where it takes like a really dark turn in the last two episodes, which surprised the shit out of me. And I was reading up on this and like, apparently it surprised the shit out of like little kids who were watching this show in Japan (laughs) who like saw things happening to their heroes that they were like, they couldn't deal with and they didn't imagine could happen to them and uh, became like violently ill (laughs) in some some cases because they were like, no, Um, but man it was such it was like such a great ending uh to that season and it makes me want to watch more sailor moon in the future um i won't say that every episode of sailor moon is worth watching i think some of them are just boring as fuck and dumb so who's your but but it is a good show so who's your favorite favorite sailor i really like sailor jupiter uh, she's tall. She's got legs that go on for days. Nice. Uh, I like her a lot. She is a little bit, uh, she just keeps, keeps falling for every man she sees. But besides that, I really like her a lot. She's pretty cool. Um, Sailor Mars is also the coolest. Yeah, Mars is awesome too. My favorite is Sailor Neptune. I don't know why. I just. So I haven't been introduced to her yet, but I'll, I'll look forward to meeting her then. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Cause you only get to introduce to like five in the first season. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool. They're, all the girls are kind of fun, and they work well together. Um, they all have their own little quirks that make them funny. And Usagi is a good leader of the group, even if she's like crying ninety five percent of the time. It's doesn't, so doesn't dumb. she get literally like a like a four or something on that test in the first few episodes? <laughs> yeah, like, prob- like there's yeah, she's she's a dumbass. Like it's well established, but uh, it's, she's she's just fun to be around like she just keeps things interesting because she's so stupid (laughs) so yeah uh cat you have some big stuff coming up this week oh fuck yes okay so tomorrow i'm gonna be on a plane so i'm gonna go from work get my ass to the airport as soon as i am done with work because i have you know two days off for july the 4th get on a plane go to la and i'm gonna be in anime expo bitches Wow. Yes. Sweet. Uh, it's going to be that fun. The biggest anime con in the United States with all the cool premieres and panels and industry people there. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And I keep keep bugging these guys because I keep messaging in the chat like, which one of these panels should I go to? I don't know. <laughs> <'Cause> like, <laughs> there's so many things at the same time. And I'm kind of like, shit. 
Yeah, listeners, if you have some suggestions for uh, panels you think Pat or uh, Cat, Pat, who's Pat? Cat should go see. Uh, you can uh, you can send her message on Discord uh, and or, like reply to this YouTube video or send us some messages on Twitter and uh, she'll we'll get it to her. Though there are a bunch of like cool premieres coming, aren't there? Like I know there's like the Hibike Euphonium movie is premiering. Yeah, they have I'm a bunch seeing, of uh, that that new movie is coming mm-hmm. out the one with the wave have you seen the promo oh yeah oh, I, I know yeah. what i know what you're talking about i forget what it's called though it's not weathering with you that's the Muskoto yeah. shinkai movie the my hero academia they're gonna be premiering several episodes of it i guess like in advance there well, that's cool because that's hmm. not coming out till like fall so that's pretty yeah cool. but i i think like the, in order to get in you have to wait for so fucking long i don't even know if i'm gonna try because <laughs> they already have like a queue because they knew it was going to be so busy they're like if you want to go to this you're gonna have to sign up the first day and you're gonna be have to be there like three hours before i'm like that's insanity i'm not wow <laughs> well we've also made a uh, cat promise that she will uh put, post pictures in discord but yes. uh, every two hours every two so two to three hours <laughs> I, I promise i will post a picture and be like i'm doing this and if I don't, you can all be demanding and shitty. But yeah, I guess we're going to try and get this episode turned around at least a little fast so that you guys can harass me about my anime expo adventures and hopefully tell me what, what I should go see and what I should go do. Because, I mean, I'm up for subjection, uh, you know, yeah. I'm up for suggestions. We'll yeah, it's not often Kat does what people tell her to do. So this is your chance. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But yeah, so I'm basically, uh, I'm not getting back to Indiana until Monday morning. So I'm okay. going to get into the the airport at 5 a.m. I'm going to have oh, to boy. get my ass to my house, get dressed, and go to work and just be a shitty bitch the whole day. <laughs> oh, Holy that sucks. shit. <laughs> oh, my God. Just watch my coworkers cower in fear of my, like, angry... <laughs> Like tired, but be fun. oh man, are you are you planning to buy some merch while you're there, or are of you trying to like? Oh, okay, cool. I cool. don't know if I'll actually. I'll, I may have to send some of it back, like in the actual mail. Yeah, because <laughs> because I don't know if I can. I don't want to pay for the bag if I don't have to. But mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know what I'll find there. But shit, I'll I'll probably buy something. It's kind of hard not. All to. kinds of sweet swag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys ready to talk about this week's anime? Yes. Uh, not this first show. Oh, well, you're such you, a baby. you have to talk about it this week, Leo, so good luck. Okay, Fruits Basket. Uh, we're, listeners should be well aware, it, it's, this one's really wearing on me. I don't feel like it's moving along very well. But mm. episode 11, this is a wonderful end. Uh, tests are over and the girls like congratulate Toru I'm finishing him uh, some boys think Saki must have did like a really good job because she she seems like the brainy type and she has those wave powers also but in actuality during midterm she had to like take a bunch of classes get her parents called in and she like remembers her mom crying <laughs> <laughs> doesn't and, like, she say this- it so dramatically too like <laughs> I remember my mother crying <laughs> yeah. like- and this I said last episode and this was the most interesting part of the whole episode <laughs> yeah. is when the damn side characters are on the screen. So uh, I don't, th- I don't disagree with that for this episode. I, I agreed okay. last episode, but uh, yeah. So Toru ends up being called away by the teacher. And when they ask her what that was about, she just says she's going to work more shifts, work, 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 mop, mm-hmm. mop, mop, whatever. Uh, tomorrow's white day. And Momiji wants to thank Toru for the chocolates by taking her on a hot spring trip. That's pretty <laughs> damn generous. I do say so myself. <laughs> well, to be fair, isn't it like an onsen that the Soma's like It's owned run? by the Soma people. The Soma <laughs> people work there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Kyo and Yuki are also invited, and Shire interrupts and asks Toru why she's behind on her school trip deposit. Apparently, her father called and told Shire that he would gladly pay, and, you know, Toru being Toru says she will pay it herself. And then the guys, like, start to begin the question, what what about you've been working a lot where all this money go and then they suddenly realize she bought all those ingredients for the chocolates she gave them so that's what she spent all her money and then she's they're like weirdly angry at her and i'm like why you can't be just kyo because kyo's (laughs) being fucking kyo Uh, they're not gonna kick her out of school it's not like they're gonna be like get out like it's a public school let her do what the fuck she wants 
Yeah, she, she just, just won't, won't be able to go on the trip, on the right? trip. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I assume. But. I mean, but does I don't know. They're even lucky they have those fucking school trips. We didn't have that shit here. Did you really not have field trips? I mean, we had occasional field trips, but they wouldn't be like somewhere nice. It would be like you mm-hmm. went downtown and you like 20 minutes away and, and you got to see a bunch of houses that were old. I did. I think we went to St. Louis in middle school. That was it. But other no, than that, no, we, yeah, it's just like yeah. they took you to like a pumpkin farm or something. Yeah, something like some, some <laughs> shitty thing that they're like, what costs a lot? Like not anything really well in the end lots of corn mazes but <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's take you indiana kids to a farm so you can see your future You're like no, it's not like you all haven't already seen this shit but let's just pretend yeah. we're we're doing something this is your you. first time now we've all yeah. been here before it's not new so after sending to to the bath keo goes on a rant about how she should have spent the money on herself and blah 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 uh before being interrupted by momuji who says a girl brought a book to class and it was a story called the most idiotic traveler in the world and i want oh, oh, i'm going to explain it but i want your two's honest opinion when this story is over what did you take from it so okay yeah the girl was an idiot this traveler was an idiot and she got duped out of all her possessions by like villagers that would say stuff like, I don't have shoes of my own. And then the girl would give them to them. And then she'd weep because she believed she was helping them and, you know, making them happy. Eventually, she gave away everything and didn't have clothes anymore. And being embarrassed, wandered through the woods and came by some demons who wanted to eat her. They used clever words to trick her and gradually get like one body part at a time. She basically derailed, I mean, Hyakimaru'd herself to them. I thought that uh, too when I was watching. <laughs> when, especially when they got to the body parts, I was like, oh, it's Hyakimaru. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so until she gave everything away until eventually she was just a head. And then the final demon munched on her eyes and said he would give her a gift. In actuality, it was just a piece of paper that said idiot. But the girl was so happy she got a gift her, that she got a gift that she wept and then died. I was just angry. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck, girl? Like, I-, I really hope that no one ever gave a shit about that girl, because otherwise it's so <laughs> selfish of her. Like, they're just going to, that person's going to be worried about them all the fucking time because they can't take care of themselves. Yeah. Like, no, that's not cool. And so I feel like this was the show's attempt to, like, reckon with people like Kat who have become very frustrated with the way Toru operates in that she gives everything of herself and wants nothing in return or expects nothing in return. And Momiji, as he like responds to this story is basically saying like, wow, I just thought that this person was so wonderful. Whereas like everybody else in my class was like, they're an idiot. Well, but they are because in reality, that is an unhealthy thing to idolize. You cannot it's not a good thing for people to give so much of themselves that they have nothing no, left there, for themselves. There are bad people in the world and they will definitely take advantage of your hospitality. Like you got to be on guard about this shit. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I definitely, okay. So I'm not saying either side is wrong. I think actually both sides have a point. I think Toru is an idiot for acting this way, but also she doesn't care because she believes in helping people even to the fault of herself. It's a very, like, New Testament way of thinking. Like, be kind to those who would even hate you. Like, like keep, keep thy enemies close. Like, it's a whole philosophy of just giving and giving and giving of yourself to make the world better despite the consequences for yourself. And it's like a, it's a philosophy of sacrifice. Death. Yeah, it's like sacrifice unto death. And I think sacrificing unto death is too much. Though I do think we, like, make martyrs of a lot of those types of people and we, like, worship them and, like, think that they're the ideal type of people. There's, like, all these figures throughout history of giving everything of themselves to a greater cause and we worship them as heroes. And so there is something to be said for these types of people. Like, I see why Momiji believes that she's a wonderful person. I think you thought about this too much. (laughs) Well, I know. I mean, it's like a big philosophy question, really. I don't know. I I mean, I think at the end of the day, like, it's up to an individual person to to decide how much of themselves they can truly give um, without losing the point of their life, basically. And that's going to vary wildly for different people. Yeah, but it would have been one thing if that was the lesson in the story, but 
there that wasn't there was like no lesson to it well i mean I it like. kind of does branch into the whole idea is that she is helping all of these people toru is helping all of these people to the detriment of herself like all of these zodiac mm-hmm. members that she meets it, mm-hmm. it's supposed to be an analogy of the situation as a whole let I don't know. I just think in re- in life, you cannot help anyone unless you can help yourself. If you give too much to any person, whether that's someone in your family, your friends, your significant other, someone you meet on the street, anyone, I mean, it, it's not going to turn out well for, for anyone else or for you. you. You have to first make sure you are taken care of before you can give to other people. I completely agree with that. And I just think the hope would be that the people that you give help to help you back. And no. yeah. that's the hope. That's the idealistic vision of the society <laughs> where people help each other out. Oh, um, you, you, you innocent child. Oh, I know. I, 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 I know society is never going to truly function that way. On the, <sighs> But on some level, sometimes it does. And I think that's what she's hoping for. Um, though she's not really asking for anything, which is like, yeah, this is like Buddhist, like ascetic take on, uh, like charity, which is maybe not healthy. Who knows? But it is oh, kind man. of admirable. So, I was just thinking, what if you took her mentality and put it in a different anime? And the one that sprang to my mind was Attack on Titan. She <laughs> would be dead day two if she made it that long. <laughs> You have to be in a specific society and world to even think that this would work. Yes. <laughs> oh man, it's so that people on that show are so corrupt sometimes. So, anyways, they go on uh, the trip to the Soma Inn in the hot spring and meet the proprietress, who's also a Soma. She's in frail health and scares Toru upon their arrival. Uh, Momiji accuses Kyo of wanting to sleep in Toru's room because he doesn't want to room with Yuki, <laughs> and the proprietress scolds Kyo for it. She's like. Even though you're the cat, I thought you were a good boy. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, but the proprietress, we have to talk about this. She looks like, um, oh, have, has any, anyone ever, you guys have, have you ever read the Wallflower manga? Like, no. No, I don't think so. Okay, so the main character of the Wallflower manga looks just like the, it's like the proprietress, right? Like a horror movie villain, mm-hmm. basically. Looks like she's going to come out of a well and get your ass, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I kept feeling so nostalgic this entire time because I'm like, it's the wallflower girl grown up. <laughs> like, I mean, especially when she starts like acting crazy, she is <laughs> pretty horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, she so, just goes around gloomy and like ah! all the time. I love her. Yeah, she gets a little energetic at moments. So they get in their separate springs in Toru has even brought the picture of her mother in a plastic bag that she talks to. Uh, that, at was, this point, I was like, for <laughs> Christ's sake. Yeah, I'm glad we all three went, really? <laughs> yeah, like, way to make everyone goofy. else feel like little pieces of dried up turd. Like, <laughs> oh, this is my mother's picture. I bring it with me to the bath in a plastic bag. Don't you feel bad for me? Like, Fuck I you. know people mourn in their own ways, and you should let them mourn. But when you go this far, I think you should step in a little bit <laughs> and help them out. I think they need it. <laughs> I was just I glad mean, that Yuki and Kyo were actually able to convince Momiji that maybe he shouldn't go swimming <laughs> with Taru in the hot spring because he is a boy and she is a girl. And I was Do like, you right. think that he secretly is like pervy? Because like, what the fuck? He is old enough to know that like he well, should well, we not don't know be. that yet, but we find out by the end of the episode. Yeah, he's, he's just supposed to be like perfect little cinnamon roll, too cute and too but innocent for this world. No one is. No one's a cinnamon <laughs> roll in this world. Anyway, go on. Okay, so the pr- proprietress shows up and informs her that informs her that her child is one of the zodiacs and he's the monkey. And then when Toru like asks more about him, the proprietress she freaks out again and starts like apologizing apologizing for him a whole lot, just like she did with a. Uh, Kyo earlier, so like I guess he's probably kind of a wild child. It'd be, be my guess. Uh, then they play ping pong, and that happens. And Yuki leaves because he wants to laugh at how bad like Toru is, and she's it's beyond comically bad. I only think the ball was across the net by the time she swung her paddle. Her paddle <laughs> that, that uh, was pretty hilarious. Like Yuki has uh, to like fucking go outside because he can't yeah. laugh. He doesn't want to laugh in front of Kyo, Mm -hmm. specifically. So she follows him outside, and he finally gives her her gift for White Day. And it's like a ribbon that she can wear in her hair. 
And he like completely woos her. She's just like, oh my God, he is really like a prince. And I guess that's a, a thing now because just in the picture for the next episode, she, you see it in her hair. Mm-hmm. So she's going to keep wearing it the whole time. Uh, they leave the hot spring. And Mumiji tells everyone that he and Haru both will be starting high school next year. And they both apply for the same school as everybody else. And Toru's like just pretty blown away. But Mumiji is it an elementary school boy. And just basically you're younger than her and immediately my mind went to the scene where he was sleeping in the same futon as her and then the part where he wanted to swim with her i'm like whoa Mm -hmm. you are not as innocent as you are and that's why (laughs) that's why i understand cat's questions like hold on hit the brakes here a minute dude (laughs) (laughs) i just imagine like inside his head he's like like little do they know this there, is all there was up some front. <laughs> brief scene where uh, Toru was like watching the three like sleep, and she like referred to Momiji as like I think the cute one or something, and then she referred to Kyo as the cool one, and then she referred to Yuki as the kind one, and I was uh, like, no, she was thinking about how she's surrounded by all these princes yeah, and stuff, all like these princes, yeah. yeah. And Toru is obviously going to get with the kind one. Obviously. <laughs> like, it's like they sold, like, I'm, I I feel like they just spoiled the whole ending of this show. Like, obviously she's going to choose the kindest one. So anyway, I mean, that's my prediction anyway. If that's I, I could your totally prediction. Wrong. Oh, If she okay. goes with the cool one, I'll just be like, what the fuck? This is dumb. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, I, okay. You heard it here, his prediction. We're saving this. We're going to record Yuki. this clip. Yuki and Toru. Reco- oh my god, I'm so excited. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm. Does it even have an ending? Does he? Does she actually finally choose? That's my big question. I feel dun, like they dun, never. Dun. They never I end. I can't tell. You. I mean, I'm telling you, like obviously, like Toru and Yuki, Yuki are gonna have like a long road. It's not gonna be an easy <laughs> road. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that, that's more spoiler than we need, so let's move on to uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Oh, I can't wait. Okay, anyway, all right. So, episode 35, The Requiem Quietly Plays, part two. So, they're all back together again, and it seems Bruno has already figured out all the mind-swapping thing, which is awesome because we, as the viewer, don't need to go through that again. Yeah, it saves time. Uh, yeah, he quickly goes for the arrow, but gets stopped by his own stand that then starts to attack him. <laughs> uh, Mista ends up saving him by firing like a bunch of bullets, knocking away the arrow, and also hitting Chariot at the same time. Then this one was strange. I It was misleading to me. Then bolt number one comes flying back with clearly some of what Chariot is like made of on him, that black plastic, mm-hmm. and attacks Mista, who gets saved by Trish as she makes the, the bullet stop. Number one doesn't stop attacking until the other bullets pull him off and slap him, and it also makes the material on him fall off. And at this point, I'm like, oh, shit, Chariot's body, if it gets on your stand, it turns the stand against the person. Oh, so you thought that's how it worked. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but like I said, because there was like the visual cues and everything there, and I was like, Mm -hmm. okay. But then we find out later, it's actually the arrow, and... Then I don't understand how Mrs. Stan why did it attacked him because was that the one that hit the arrow and moved it? Well, yeah, yes. it's like the whole thing is that the Chariot Requiem's like berserker mode makes it so your stand will attack you if you try to take the arrow. Um, and so Mrs. Stan backfired on him. For- His berserker mode or the arrow itself? It's the, the stand. arrow itself. It's the stand in berserker mode. It's not the arrow itself. It makes the arrow act like that. Uh, it is. It is like the stand protecting the arrow. I think it is like so Char- he, chariot requiem protecting the arrow with his own stand okay. ability. Is it's, how I see. I it. don't. Okay, I don't find it that clear. But mm-hmm. I could not. I, this whole episode, I was so confused. <laughs> I have a feeling it's only going to get more confusing, too. I, I like, almost checked out halfway through, and I had to rewind and, like, try to... I I don't know. It it just seems so chaotic. I don't understand, really. It it was chaotic. I I had a problem running this one. There was points where I'd watch, like, a three, five-minute clip, and then I'd go to the dock and have to sit and go, how do I word this? (laughs) What the fuck just happened? (laughs) Because I'm, like, literally just staring at the screen with the hands over the keyboard going... And then chair, 
no, 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 ba- delete. <laughs> okay, so like, is, it this, was bad. is this common with JoJo series, or is this just for this one? Oh, no, there's definitely, like, overcomplicated shit in, like, every JoJo. Oh, yeah, they, yeah. they get crazy. Okay, because yeah. I, keep, I keep being like, am, I don't understand why I'm not getting this. I don't, it, it can't be that complicated, it's anime. Well, and it's then I, like, rewind it. It's not because, like, all the characters have swapped bodies, so they're using different stands than they should be, like, they look like they should be using. And you have, like, this hidden power that is emerging from both the arrow, but is apparently controlled by Chariot, who is also dead, but separated from Polnareff, who is in a turtle. So, it's like, it's like fucking retarded right now. It's ridiculous. If you told that to anybody else, they'd want to check you into a mental asylum. Like, like what uh-huh, the- okay, just- yeah. Just come with this me. is just gibberish. <laughs> he's just—he's not saying anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Cherry ends up getting his arm back, and along with the arrow, and he just like walks away. Everybody deduces that it's the arrow that can control their stands if they try to retrieve the arrow with them. <laughs> so yeah, they, the show says it's the arrow. Yeah. So I so weird. Um, that's when Bruto's body starts to get up. So they have Mista shoot him to keep him down. And then, like, Narancia starts to celebrate a little early and talks about going to school when they get back, eating some pizza, and even palling around with Fugo, who I totally forgot was even in this fucking show. <laughs> yeah, I forgot I about like, him I, entirely. I, I went, Fugo, oh. <laughs> but as soon as, oh, God. I, I mean, as soon as Narancia starts talking about stuff he wants to do, I'm just like, death flag, death flag, death flag. <laughs> <laughs> I wish the show was just like a little less blatant with its death flags and foreshadowing, but yeah. So they decide they're also going to shoot the body in the legs just to be extra safe. And Mista needs the bullets in his boots and asks Trish to hand them to him. That was one of the sentences where like, how do I word this? Mista needs the bullets in his boots and asks <laughs> Trish to hand them to him. I was just like, wow. <laughs> and then that's when they suddenly have a time skip and start freaking out. Uh, basically what, like, Trish was handing the, God, I, you know, to, like, slightly pause. Trish is handing the bullets to Mista when they're suddenly in his hand and a couple are on the floor. And they're like, uh, when did that exchange happen? So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also noticed that Crimson Emperor didn't come out of Bruno's body and can't figure out how it can't be Diavolo in the body. Mista is freaking out about how he can't stand the number four around him and tells Trish to drop more bullets or something. Yeah, that was superstitious, yeah. Yeah, just a superstition thing. I'm like, that doesn't need to be written in here. Uh, Bruno also asks Trish if she can feel Diavolo's presence, and she can't. That's when they look up and see Narancia skew- skew- skewered on some uh, metal bars. Yeah. Uh, they get it, yeah. This is very like dramatic, and I was just like, I, I can't be that scared. Like, I don't. It, everything was too weird. <laughs> well, it would have been. Oh, it would have been surprising if they hadn't just like death flagged the shit out of Narancia like three seconds before. Like that would have been like a really like shocking thing to like have everybody suddenly realize the only person we don't see is Narancia, who is in Giorno's body, by the way. It kind of pissed yeah. me off, though, because I like Narancia a lot, and they're mm-hmm. going to fucking kill off this cute little Too kid. Bad. Yep. Boo! Uh, they, <laughs> they get the body down as Giorno starts to heal the wounds. Unfortunately, he says it's just an empty shell, and Narancia's soul has already moved on. Why couldn't they just kill off Mista? Mista's <laughs> annoying. I like Mista more than Nar- Honestly, if I had to pick, it would have been Narancia to go. Oh, Me too. you're a shitbag. No, I like Narancia. <laughs> I would have killed off Mista. <laughs> Uh, Mista's one of my more favorites. I think Mista's been all probably time. dying too. I feel like a lot of these guys are going to die before the show is over, honestly. Why are they killing everyone off? I mean, it's one thing to kill off like one character. Why are they killing off so many fucking characters? They usually kill off a couple. Sometimes they do come back randomly. But To be fair, they all are members of the mafia. <laughs> they are criminals and bad people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but they're not supposed to be bad people to us. Like, I know, I know. <laughs> and since uh, his old body's an empty shell, Giorno manages to slip back into his own body. Uh, we also see Fugo like look up into the sky like he almost sensed it. So that was interesting. And then pulling her off, basically figures it out. Since Diavo, Diavolo and Dopio are two different people sharing a body, that Dopio ended up in Bruno's body and Diavolo ended up in somebody else's. Uh, they also guessed that he targeted Narancia so they couldn't use the radar anymore and he could go after the arrow himself more easily and not be detected and found. Uh, 
As they leave the Coliseum, you actually see Emperor Crimson watching them from the shadows. Did you guys catch that? I saw him, like, yeah, in between a couple pillars, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they easily catch up a chariot who's just, like, walking. It's not even, like, paying attention to them. And Bruno, like, just easily sticks his leg out and trips it, and it drops the arrow. Mm-hmm. And they say it appears to be very weak. And when Giorno, he, like, slowly tries to grab the arrow, his stand starts to come out also. Yeah, and it's like preventing him from doing it. Yeah, that like it's going to attack him if he tries to get closer. He even gently tosses a rock at the arrow that then just comes hurtling right back at him really quickly. Mm-hmm. They figure a non-stand user might be able to grab the arrow and Ponorov manages to pick it up since he's standless now. Mm-hmm. And that causes Chariot to start to rush at him and then it just stops on that little cliffhanger there. And who's he? He yells at uh, like Mista to like pierce himself with the arrow before... Uh uh, the chariot can reach them, basically. Oh, did he say that? Yeah, yeah. He says that. He's like, come pierce yourself, pierce your stand on the arrow, basically. Oh, that would transfer. I, I wonder why he picked Mista. Um, probably because he's the one who's going to die next. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's my guess. Uh, well, at, yeah. least I'll, uh, at least he won't have, Naranchi won't be the only one who fucking dies. Uh. If Trish dies, we riot. That's yeah, all I'm saying. That, I agree with that. I mean, they can't get rid of the hot girl. <laughs> no. no. Uh, yeah, I just wish there had been more surprise with Narancia's death. Um, otherwise, this was like a really like just like transition episode. It's like moving from the last thing. Do you guys have any theory on whose body Diavolo took over? I mean, they keep showing like that woman and the baby. It's not them. And then like the dog and the guy who like got transferred with his dog, yeah. like howling. I, they showed keep, that like three different times that episode. I keep, okay. <laughs> the thing that weirds me out, I don't have any theories. I don't understand why the music they keep playing for all of those scenes is like weird murder mystery house music. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you're in a video game, not a good video game though. And, and then you're like trying to figure out who did it or something. Who done I don't, it? Because it's like da 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 da, and I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? Why did you pick this? Well, <laughs> so yeah, the only theory I could come up with that whose body Diavolo ended up in is either it's got to be a rando because the only other body it could possibly be in would be Ponorov's fucked up body. Oh, I didn't think about that. That's true. Could potentially be that. But if but his body's dead, who knows? Yeah. He says his body's dead and his soul's barely clinging on to the turtle. Unless he managed to somehow... It's JoJo. They could just give us some crazy explanation of why he was able to stay alive and, uh, you know, Ponorov's body for some fucked up reason. But Yeah. Uh, or unless, like, his consciousness jumped into one of the guys, like Giorno or... Bruno or something? Who knows? I don't fucking know. Oh, that'd be a trippy one. That'd be weird. Let's see how weird it gets next week. I'm excited. <laughs> I just hope I can follow it better. I was struggling this episode. Well, you should try writing it. <laughs> yeah. Could you follow uh, Demon Slayer? And- oh, yes. Yeah. So Demon Slayer is always fucking easy to follow. Yes, it is. This episode is Suzumi Mansion, and this was also like a mystery mansion or some shit. I don't it know was. what that's. That, that maybe that's a theme of this episode: mystery mansion. I don't know. <laughs> um, like a mystery. I will. I will say off the top, Zenitsu is so goddamn fucking annoying. So I mean, annoying. Multiple drives me up the wall. <laughs> multiple people besides Leo had warned me about Zenitsu going into this episode, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to give this guy a shot. Like five minutes in, I was like, holy fuck! Holy <laughs> <my God." laughs> but, but that's his whole point as a character. But okay, yeah. so so Zenitsu is this dude? Is this blonde, blonde ass fucking bitch? So they start out the episode. He's accosting this poor woman in the street, and he's just like, please marry me. And <laughs> yeah, pretty much. He, he's got this cute sparrow. That's his. Instead of having the obnoxious crow, he's the obnoxious one, and the sparrow was cute. I don't know. I don't understand the dichotomy here. Like, wh- why can't they all have these cute sparrows? They go choo 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 choo. Like, okay, so that that one part confused me though, because like Zenitsu wasn't able to like speak, like understand his sparrow. Yeah. But, but then he understood the crow, right? Like the crow yeah, was speaking. Think- so the crows literally speak English, English. and the sparrow yeah. doesn't. It's just that uh, fucking Tanjiro can 
speak can speak bird, bird for some bird some way. Yeah, but we, they don't explain why he can speak fucking bird. That was my bird. question though. Was it Ken Tondro actually understand the sparrow or was he yes. just telling Zenitsu that to no, tell him that under, his sparrow? He can understand the sparrow. I don't know how the fuck okay. he can. It's weird. I don't know what what Disney movie Tanjiro <laughs> don't worry is fucking about the logistics from. cat. Just go with it. <laughs> it pissed me off. I was like, this you. is bullshit. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so Tanjiro yells at the blonde, who we know is Zenetsu, to stop bothering this fucking woman and get out of the middle of the goddamn world. Like, yeah, that immediately made me just, di- I, I liked, I disliked the guy on the premise of him just accosting the woman right off the way. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? And then he just gets worse and worse. I'm like, can we kill this character off, please? Yeah, he's and he's like, brat. to Tanjiro, he's like, why did you get in my way? Where? Because oh, so you were annoying. being a bitch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tan- I you love how Tanji just like stares at him with like empty face and just like, uh. Yeah, he's like, because you were literally assaulting a woman, you dumbass. <laughs> and so he's like, get on the fucking road. You're making trouble for your sparrow. For the sparrow. <laughs> it, and I don't know, like, he doesn't seem to even remember the blonde from the exam selections. Yeah. Um, and, and Zanetsu reminds him. And I don't know, like. <sighs> This whole situation is weird. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so the gr- the girl's about to leave and is like, "Thank you, Tanjiro, my hero." When the blonde's like, "No, I wasn't done accosting her. I want to attack her some more," and she just fucking loses her shit as she should have done in the beginning and just starts <laughs> slapping the fuck out of him like in the middle of the road, just like <laughs> bah, bah, bah. and apparently all she did was help him when he's collapsed on the side of the road and and. He's just been harassing her since then, and she already has a fucking fiance. Not that that really matters, but like, goddamn, dude. And he's just like, I could die any day. I need you to marry me. Oh, they have a lot of work to do to make us root for this character at some point. I don't even know if they want us to root for this character. I think the whole idea is for us to hate him, mm-hmm. just to be like, he's supposed to be slapsticky, I think. But I don't know. At this point, Tanjiro gives the guy the, the look that Bihan was talking about, the, like, what a piece of fucking dirt look. It's great. Actually, I really feel like that should be, like, a emoji on our uh, Discord. That what? screenshot of him making that face. Oh. <laughs> there you go, Bihan. The uh, you got some work to do. face. That is a pretty good face, actually. Yeah, that's like that's that. a good one. Yeah. So the blonde's like, it's your fault I wasn't able to get married. And it's just like... Fucking shut your mouth. <laughs> I don't know. So, apparently the way Zenetsu became a demon slayer is he gets swindled by a woman and has a lot of Damn debt women. because of that. Oh, swindled. yeah, because yeah, I'm sure he wasn't just a fucking <laughs> stupid-ass bitch, and that's why he got swindled. I'm sure it was all the woman. Yeah. Um, And he has a lot of debt because of that. Then this old guy came along. He's like, I'll take over your debt. But apparently it says he was a cultivator, which I assume means he like made selection, like made people ready to take the demon slayer exam. That's my guess, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, And so he had he was required to go take it as a condition of getting the debt taken over. Mm-hmm. Um, So he did that and he somehow survived. And and he's like freaking out because he's like, oh, I'm gonna die. And I just kept thinking, you did fucking pass the exam. You're obviously not that incompetent. Stop being a whiny bitch. Like, I mean, B- Bochi has more backbone than this fucker does. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know what? You're right. She does. <laughs> But yeah, and she passes out when she gets excited, for God's <laughs> sake. And then he, eventually he stops crying like a two-year-old child. And Tanjiro gives him a rice ball because Z- Zenetsu says he's hungry. and But it's his only rice ball. So then Zenetsu gives him back half of it. And, I mean, that's all very cute. But, like, you cannot cut a rice ball in half with your hand like that. <laughs> that is not a thing that you can fucking do. This it was, like, he, perfect. He tears the, uh, at, he tears the seaweed in half, I worked at a Japanese too. restaurant. Yeah. I made many a fucking onigiri in my day. <laughs> you cannot just take it and c- pull it apart and have, a, have perfect little fucking halves. No. <laughs> that shit would be all over the ground. <laughs> I, it's hard enough for me to eat it without it being all over the ground in one piece. 
But you see, Kat, this is exactly what Toru Honda wanted. Was she wants to give everything, just like just like Tanjiro is here. She he gives his whole onigiri. So what happens next, Kat? <laughs> And I'm just he gets saying, it he gets it back because Zenitsu is also a nice person. Uh huh. And then the Sparrow complains to Tanjiro that it, this dude's always whining and not wanting to go to work and hitting on girls and and I, I mean that obviously it's true, but also like what a bitchy Sparrow. Like <laughs> the the Sparrow's kind of a bitch too. I don't no, know. Do you blame the Sparrow? <laughs> the well, Sparrow's like, putting up with a lot of shit. I, I will I say. I mean, he, he's he's also whining though. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Um. But yeah, yeah, but he the sparrow has a fucking good ass reason. <laughs> well, yeah, but like, also it's also already obvi- obvious, like that that's the case. He doesn't need to say it over and over again. Yeah, I don't Fair. know. Suddenly, Tanjiro smells something that he has never smelled before, and they come across this house, and there are two small, like, scared kids nearby. And it's not really sure, clear what's going on. They ask them what's up, and they just start shaking. And Tanjiro tries to calm them down with the cute-ass sparrow that goes, choo choo. that I just, <laughs> I want the fucking sparrow. It's adorable. <laughs> choo-choo, <laughs> choo-choo. It's really adorable. Like, the way it flaps its wings, and it's like, choo, it's very adorable. Yeah, but then they just quietly cry. Like, instead of being like, oh, I'm calm now, like, tears just start going down their fucking face. And I think Tanjiro's like, oh, shit, did I break them? <laughs> um, but but they're like, oh, it's a monster's house, and their big brother got taken away by this monster. Um, and it didn't look at them at all, just the brother. And they followed the monster to this house because they left smears of blood behind from their brother. Um, so that's the story they tell them. And then suddenly Zenetsu hears like a weird sound that Tanjiro can't hear, and then a bo- and I'm like, what do you mean? What do you- Why does everyone have like the the one? you know, sense Super that's sense. better. Yeah, like, what is the... Are, is there going to be other ones that come? Like, someone that feels really intensely next? Like, what's... I don't understand this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so a body falls out of the second floor of the house, and the guy says, like, even though I made it outside, I'm still going to die? And then he dies. But apparently that wasn't the brother. So Tanjiro is going to go into the house, but Zenetsu's like, yeah! And so, so Tanjiro's like, fine, whatever. Puts um, his sister down with the kids and is like, take care of this box. And they both go inside. And then, of course, like, not even five minutes later, the kids follow them in. And Tanjiro's like, not only do I not want you fucking kids in this situation, but also my sister's out there. <laughs> but I also don't blame the kids because they're like, your box was making weird noises. <laughs> we don't want to sit next to it. I, I got to get that. Uh, suddenly the girl and Tanjiro get moved to another room. So, like, this is the ability of whatever demon lives in this house, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's pretty cool. people just randomly. It's almost like they can just change the room. But Tanjiro thinks it's not that they're changing the room, it's that they're moving the people in the house in- to the different rooms. Yeah, and this seems to be the power of his Suzumi drums, which are those, like, Traditional Japanese drums that are shaped like an hourglass that often feature in uh, Japanese theater, like kabuki and no theater. And so it's like this whole house is like, I don't know, it seems like it was a shifting stage like of rooms, too, because when Zenitsu is downstairs, he goes and runs to where he thinks the door was, and then it gets like moved. It's a different place where, than where he thought it was. But maybe he was just moved somewhere in the house also. I'm not sure. I, okay. I, my theory is that the drums, because like we see the demon has like m- more than one drum on his chest. I feel like the different drums have like different abilities to like move things around the house or to move the house itself. I've seen the next episode, so I have no comment. Okay, mm. then, it gets explained. Okay, okay. Then suddenly T- Tanjiro sees this demon, who is the main bad guy, I guess you could call him, mm-hmm. and. Um, <laughs> And then they switch to uh, Zenetsu with the little boy. And the little boy starts calling Zenetsu out on his <laughs> shit. Because Zenetsu's like, I don't want to be here. I'm scared. And the boy's like, I'm five years old. And I think you're a fucking pussy. Like, get your shit together, basically. And, <laughs> and Zenetsu tries to leave to get grown-ups. What the fuck? Are you not an adult? 
Yeah. <laughs> and none of the doors will lead outside anymore. And the weird boar headed thing like starts to appear. You know, the one you keep seeing in the in the opening that I yep. was about to lose my shit if they weren't in this episode. It appears <laughs> and runs away. And then so where Tanjiro is, the demon says this really weird line. It says, thanks to them, he got away when he was my prey. Why do they all keep barging into someone else's home? Yeah. A child with rare blood I found myself. Um, also, so I don't also know. all explained next episode. I figured it would be explained later, but yeah, it's a little mysterious yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the room flips again. And the board jumps, the boar headed guy jumps into the room with Tanjiro and prepares to fight this demon. So, next episode, first of all, take that fucking thing off your head. I'm pretty sure it's not his actual head. I want to see his actual face. I'm you tired what, of it. You know what annoyed me more about him is that he's voiced by Yoshitsugu Matsuoka, who is Kirito from Sword Art Online. So yeah. I just hear, like, Ooh. Kirito's voice, like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, no. Nice. <laughs> I just finished watching, like, Sword Art uh, Alicization, and I can't oh, take any more of Kirito's I'm voice. I'm so sorry that you did that to yourself. I, I, I am mean, too, Cat. I've barely recovered. Thank you, Sailor understand. Moon, for helping. There, there's a whole room <laughs> in Anime Expo that is just going to be playing all of Sword Art Alicization. <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't understand why people would do that. That is the why most would, depressing room at Anime Expo, I guarantee you, go, you. Why would you go to an anime convention and be like, let me watch the shittiest anime from last season. Let's do it. The one with the lowest ratings. Uh. Oh, my God. Also, Zenitsu is voiced by uh, Hiro Shimono, who is Connie in Attack on Titan. So not as bad there, but uh, I oh, was cool. thinking during this episode to myself, which I know Leo's going to disagree with, but like, I feel like when when I see Zenitsu and the way he acts, that's how Leo sees all of the characters in Sarazan Mai, like, <laughs> when he watches that show, like, overly dramatic and ridiculous, and I'm just like, hmm. Zenitsu is annoying. The characters <laughs> in, in uh, Sarazan Mai are just overly dramatic. I guess two I could see it. It's a different two thing. Two different yeah. reasons. I hate them both, but god damn it. I was just I think chuckling they need, to like, myself. A bitch, a bitch stick for him. Just like a, a stick that's shaped like a hand that every time he whines, just get out the, the stick that says bitch on it and just hit him in the face. I just can tell that someday he's going to be like the hero and he's going to save them and I'm going to be annoyed about it. He, he's probably going to like cry <laughs> right before he saves them and then mm -hmm. do it. And it's supposed to be like some lesson about how even people who are afraid can can do what what they need. They know needs to nope, be done. That's probably what the it fuck it's going to You're reading be. into it too much. <laughs> no, but isn't that what it always ends up being like? like mm -hmm. And then what I what I was predicting ended up being true so i won't say it but like that's not you're not right though no. <laughs> well the boar the boar guy is also just like a beefcake who is just pure shonen energy uh the so. boar guy acts like an adhd person <laughs> on crack <laughs> i don't pretty good place to be he's he's hyper and runs around and screams way too fucking much that's my impression of him right now i don't know you know who else screams a lot? Dororo and Tahomaru in this next episode. Yeah. Uh, episode 23, the story of the demons. Uh, they begin their fight and they yell at Hyakimaru that the limbs and the eyes were never his and they are taking it back instead what is theirs. So like that's like kind of like the theme. They're like, no, this is ours. It's not yours. And Hyakimaru's like, no, it's my eyes. I want them. <laughs> uh Back at the village, a guy's like having trouble controlling the colt and eventually gets free and runs off. Him and like another villager decide to follow it and see what's up. And then Dororo, Nui, Nokata, and Biwaimaru arrive to watch the battle. And Biwaimaru explains that Hyakimaru might not even be able to recognize Dororo right now and that the other three aren't quite themselves either. Kind of like the demon parts are kind of controlling them. Mm-hmm. So Ponit, I mean Demon Horse, manages <laughs> to pin Hyogo to the ground and then gets distracted when she hears her colt cry out. It's enough of a distraction that Hyogo and Mutsu both stab the horse. I felt bad. Horse, I was sad about this. 
poor well, horse. That's okay, because the horse gives no fucks <laughs> and bites down on Hyago's head, fucking rips it off, and then mule kick mule kicks Mutsu. That. Because like I was sad, and Leo's like, well, the horse gives no fucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I was like instantly happy when the horse ate Hyogo's head. I was like, yeah, fuck Hyogo. <laughs> like ripped it off and threw it. <laughs> and so it uh, mule kicks Mutsu, and then Hyogo's headless body rises, and Mutsu's body both come flying back at the horse and stab it again before both of their bodies collapse to the ground Tahumaru sees this and abandons his fight with Yakimaru to go to uh, to their aid uh, but fortunately Demon Horse manages to be reunited with her cult before she passes away and Tahumaru makes it to Matsu just in time to hear her tell him he, you know, he'll save the land and then she dies herself uh, they had some fucking shitty deaths uh <laughs> yeah those are pretty shitty deaths actually <laughs> yeah. yeah uh he then attacks yakimaru one more time who has now grown back both his arms and he has to pick up his old blades to defend himself and wounds his hands in the process yeah just a little bit about uh mutsu and hyogo i don't know if they really deserved the deaths they got because hmm. They were just really serving Tahumaru, you know? Yeah, it's just tragic. They're, they got caught up in this, and they had these ideals of protecting the land that gave them an opportunity to come back after being, like, slaves, basically, and servants and having nowhere else to go, and they were just good friends and good soldiers, and they just got caught up in this tragic deal with the devil that Daigo made, so... Yeah, I mean, their, their loyalty to Tahumaru is to be uh, envied. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty great. So, Dororo and Nui Nakata also show up, and Hyakimaru hides his hands from them like he thinks they're there to take them. <laughs> he then flees because he seems to be confused a little bit, and Tahumaru goes after him. He eventually catches up, and Hyakimaru has now wrapped his hands to the blade so he won't have to harm himself anymore. And when Tahumaru notices that Hyakimaru's reach is longer now that he has his arms back, he flees himself this time with Hyakimaru in pursuit. Uh, I'm gonna hand most of this next part off to you, Bcom. You wrote a lot about it. Uh, back with the yeah. others, when one of the villagers suggests Yakimaru gives his body back to the demon so the land can prosper, Doro goes off on him and says, "What about bro?" You know, Kata eventually speaks up and basically speculates what actually was the right thing for them to do in that situation. And yeah, what'd you write about that part? Yeah, so I, I think this conversation between Nui, Doro, and Biomaro is like basically just lining the whole philosophy of the show. And like, so Nui saying that she realizes now that even though the good of the many is more important than the good of the one, sacrificing one person is a fragile way to obtain peace. It's not going to obtain a long lasting peace. Instead, what you need to do is build that peace through the sacrifice and strength of many different people instead of taking a shortcut and just feeding what is handed to you or eating what is handed to you, like that is fed to you by the hand of the demons. Um, and this is something Dororo can buy into as well because she has seen Hyakimaru's strength and how it can bring about like what you want and get get what you need. But then that is also tempered by Biwamaru who says that, you know, the pursuit of strength can turn you into a demon though. And the, on the other hand, the rejection of all worldly things uh, like he sees sort of in Nui Kata, Nui no Kata, can bring you down the path of the Buddha and like the path of mercy but neither of these paths to the extreme are a human path. And so in the end, Dororo kind of decides it's the person's individual heart that determines how they end up. If they have a strong enough heart, they can walk the line between those two philosophies and find a middle path that, that will work. And so it was, it was pretty good. I liked how those three, three people come together there to like iron out like what all of this means. It's kind of nice because a lot of shows like – won't fucking tell you what they're trying to say. And I kind of appreciate <laughs> it when characters who make sense tell you what the show is trying to say. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it was good and all. But at the time when I watched it, I was in like the state of mind of like, I don't want to think. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was good. So then we go to where Daigo is, who is stressing about his war when he is informed an army is approaching. He then gets told about his two sons fighting and he doesn't think Tamaro can lose to a demon's leftovers and that kind of also makes him decide that he's going to go onto the battlefield himself and help defend the east where the army is coming from what Ta Tahomaru did was he led Hiyakimaru back to the castle because uh, like the 
uh, hallways are more narrower. And since he has a longer reach, it messes with him a little bit. And he tells everybody to leave unless they want to die. There's like a monster on the way. And they have their fight. And like, I just felt like it was very cliche when they inadvertently set the castle on fire. I was like, because <laughs> of course. The other, whatever. Well, there was one cliche that was like kind of subverted to at the beginning of the fight when Taho Maru asks Hyakimaru, do you have any last words? And then Hyakimaru just like instantly lunges at him and starts the fight. Because like, you don't usually see that. Like, usually when somebody asks if you have any last words, like, there's some little monologue or so there's some sound bite, there's some shit you need to say. Hyakimaru has yeah. nothing to say to him at all. He's just instantly in the fight, which I liked. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. And then it's like shows like everybody kind of running towards the castle because they see it's on fire. And uh, Doro had a pretty good little monologue there. There's something about, I'll be your eyes if you need eyes i'll be your arms if you need arms just you know survive or whatever mm-hmm. but then like kind of cryptically we see jukai with like a statue like that mercy statue yeah and he says it's time to do what i must do and it's just like yeah what what <laughs> i'm glad that you is gonna play a role in the end here but i f- i feel like his role is gonna just be like undertaker to yaki maru's dead body <laughs> like, i mean it makes yeah. sense that he is gonna play some role mm-hmm. i don't know in the end i don't feel like any any one person is gonna get what they want i think Possibly the whole thing will be passed on to uh, the title of the show, Dororo, to figure out in the future. I I had a thought while watching this episode. My thought was, uh, Hiyakimaru does end up killing Tahumaru, and he gets his eyes back, but he also suffered a fatal blow Mm -hmm. and gets to finally see before he then passes away. That makes a ton of sense because, you know, the ED, which is like the blurry images, which is supposed to be Hiyakimaru's vision, at the very end of the ED... What comes into clear vision for Hyakimaru is Dororo's face. So yeah, that that's would make a ton f- of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that's what's going to happen. And I would, I would be happy with that ending. Yeah. The only part of this episode I was really annoyed with is there's a moment where Hyogo is under the demon horse and like he has uh, speared it in the neck. And so his face gets splattered with blood. And it, it was bad. It looks so so bad because it was like there was like a layer of the blood in after effects or something that was on top of his face (laughs) that moved completely independently of the face like it was just so bad but that was the only it was that was the only moment that was really jarring yeah it was jarring to me i i kind of physically kind of set back a little bit like what the yeah running out of that budget there's always something rushed like i mean that's the thing you hope they fix that one little moment for like a blu-ray or something someday like Hopefully I always feel it's it's not even that they're rushed. It's just like they're digging deep in the bat- bottom of their pockets and they don't really have much left and they're like, shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, this is literally on the screen for a second and a half. Let's not worry about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, All right. We done with the first half. Anything else on Doro? No, I think nope. I'm excited to, to see the end. Yeah, I want to see this end too. Yeah. All right. Yeah, me too. I'm hype. All right, we will be right back after these messages from our fellow podcasters. Hi, I'm JD, your host of the Red Leaf Retrocast, your best location to learn, remember, and relive the past to the present. Our podcast has four shows for you to listen to between retro gaming, modern gaming, anime, and even wrestling. The Retro Gaming Cast covers discussion topics, and each episode we discuss retro games picked based on a decided theme for that episode, ranging from space all the way to console specials like the old handheld Game Boy. Our Modern Gaming Cast is monthly and covers video game titles that were released in that previous month. Each anime cast, we focus to review a retro anime each and every episode, like the original Mobile Suit Gundam to the racing hit Initial D. But that's not all. We also keep up with the seasonal shows by occasionally doing impressions and reviews as well. Finally, our last show is about wrestling, where we keep the rising indie scene up to date while also covering shows from the bigger promotions like Ring of Honor, New Japan, and WWE, so we cover it all. We also cover a retired wrestler every episode in what we call the Wrestler Spotlight and are currently on a quest covering old WCW Thunder episodes from the late 90s, every cast. So if any one of those casts sound like something you'd like to check out, 
That's the Red Leaf Retrocast Gaming, Anime, and Wrestling. Found at iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting sites. Also, you can learn, remember, and relive the past to the present. We can't wait to see you soon. The Trash Pandas bring you this nugget from another trash can. What happens when Brains and Bullets discuss episode 2 of One Punch Man? Pretty much gene splicing (laughs) heads. They will oh, sp- yep, 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 yep. Yeah, they will splice genes. They have a a cyborg gorilla. They have a frog that walks on two legs and communicates at long range. Like they got, you think it? They splice the lion king. Yeah, they they have the lion. They have a f-ing lion beast king, and <laughs> Simba. Yeah, he's f-ing Simba. I don't mean he's f-ing Simba. I mean he's f-ing Simba. We at Trash Pandas Watch Anime dig through the trash so you don't have to. You can find the Trash Pandas Watch Anime podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter where we'll get live updates from what we do. And we are back. Uh, We are back after a break where uh, Cat's dog had a nice little walk. uh, Had a good time out there. Didn't eat a baby, which was good. Wanted to, wanted very badly didn't get to salivate him. Didn't get eaten either, the dog. <laughs> yes, also didn't get eaten. <laughs> but uh, it's time to talk about Attack on Titan Season 3 Part 2. Where lots of things get eaten. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, this is episode 58 or 9 of 10 in this part of the season, uh, which some people refer to as Season 4. I don't know who, though. I don't, I don't know those people. Um, but yeah, a lot of shit falling out with that flashback that we went through last week and uh now we learn even more about the cat, history of I the think Titans. Kat is still recovering from last week. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. The episode opens up we're still in that flashback with Grisha watching the owl titan or whoever, you know, Kruger, wreck the soldiers by the sea at the outer wall of Paradise Island where the you know where they live and everything. It turns out Kruger's full name is Aaron. Kruger. Holy shit. <laughs> so I, I think we know who Aaron was named yeah, after. Yeah, who's he named after? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> uh, Imagine, okay, okay, so I'm going to ruin a little bit of it for you, become. Imagine being ordered by someone to go have a child. Like, not, not like you wanted to, <laughs> but like, your secret mission was to go and find someone and have a kid. It wasn't, it was just to have a fucking family. It's a little bit bigger than just have a kid. No, it's just, I mean, it's just the kid because he needs to pass on the, the thing. Yeah. It is it's pretty really weird. just for the kid. Yeah. It's not really the family thing. Like, I, I guess the, it's lucky that the wife never knew that that. That was what was going on because that that would be so fucked up. You realize like your spouse has just been a secret agent and like married you for cover. And it's that- also weird to name your kid after like one of those Nazi soldiers who was there the day your sister died and who like yeah. killed all of these people. Turn it will turn them into titans anyway. And then oh, just and then, to be the cherry on top that your your yeah. partner's ex wife eats you comes to kill you and eats you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in a non kinky way, and then like, <laughs> oh, and by the way, your secret agent uh, husband is is also like going to make it so that your kid only lives like ten more years 13. or some shit. Thirteen, <laughs> thirteen more years. Like he's gonna die young, and it's all your husband's fucking fault. He's so lucky she never found out about all that shit while she was alive. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so anybody who is uh, acquainted with Cat, don't keep secrets from her. <laughs> I wouldn't no. do that ever. Yeah. Bad idea. So yeah, once Grisha comes to terms with what's happening, he's quick to ask Kruger, why did you only save me out of all the people on top of this wall uh, from becoming a Titan and no one else? And Kruger kind of just responds that he's severed thousands of fingers and he's turned many people, even women and children, into Titans. And it was all for the sake of Eldia. But he doesn't have much time left. And so he's like, Grisha, I entrust you with my final task. Yeah, his 13th year is like this year, isn't it? Yes. 
Uh, we'll get I, to I that in a second. I entrust you with my final task. Go forth and <laughs> fuck so that the, the resistance may prosper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he even tells Grisha, like, you know, if your sister hadn't died and all that, uh, you wouldn't have enough anger pent up inside you <laughs> against the Marley to be able to make it to this point. Um, oh, and Kruger tells him about how his father was like a part of an earlier revolution against the Marley, which was put down and like all these people were burnt to death and he remembers like peeking out of a closet as watching like his father die and he believes he still might just be that cowardly kid he was then peeking through the crack in the closet, which he clearly is because he talks about how the nine titans who inherit the power of the, or the people who inherit the power of the titans, sorry, they die within 13 years. And his time is almost up. He is like wasted 13 years just pushing people off this wall and turning them into Titans and not getting any shit done, apparently. Uh, so he is a coward. Well, like, I think no, he's right. he helped make the, re- the uh, revolt back in the other land. Yeah, I guess he supported that behind the scenes, but it took an lo- awful long time to get anything done. I don't know. <sighs> but he, he feels like he's kind of wasted some of his time. and He's hoping that Grisha is the one who has the motivation to carry out what he couldn't get done in the time that he had. Um, and back in real time, like it is like actually Aaron who is telling Armin about this because he's remembering this stuff. Um, and Armin realizes, shit, I only have 13 years left. And Aaron's like, I only have eight. And Mikasa's <laughs> like, fuck me. <laughs> Mikasa is like, I won't be able to fuck him for very much longer. Yeah. I need to get on it. Stat. <laughs> Casa's like, no, it can't be true. It can't be. Um, oh, man. And so we also learn if a person possessing the power of one of the nine titans dies before passing it on, that power is inherited by an unborn baby who is also a subject of Ymir, which is what they call like, the Eldians who can turn. Oh, what, um, what convenient magic that is. Yeah, that's very strange. Uh, but apparently it's because they're all connected by these unseen pathways. Woo! <laughs> through, <laughs> through which they share things yeah. like memories and this is all, very yeah. hippy dippy it is yeah like like it, the part at the very 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 end where you you know the part i'm talking about mm-hmm. the trippy part with the dream where he's like you must do it for the sake of aaron and mikasa and, da, 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 da. and he's like who what do you mean Dude, and what he's the like, fuck oh, was that about who, that oh, we're gonna get to that are the- and I'm like, what All right. the fuck? I specifically put that in the notes. What the fuck was that about? But we'll wait till we get there. Yeah, we need to we need to talk oh, about that. That's like um, an acid trip is what that is. <laughs> so all of these <laughs> paths between these Eldian people cross at one coordinate, the founding Titan, which Aaron now has control over. Um, Kruger says that he had to let Dina... He's getting back to why he only saved Grisha. He had to let Dina be made into a Titan because he was afraid that Zeke would spill the beans about her royal blood and that the uh, Marley would like keep her and like force her to just make babies over and over to like make a weapon for them basically to attack the Eldians. And so he believes she's better off this way, (laughs) even though she's a Titan like rampaging around now. Um, and Grisha, after hearing all this, is re- really reluctant to follow through with Kruger's plan. He's just like, I'm done. I'm tired of being hateful. And Kruger basically tells him that from the moment he went outside the walls with his sister, Grisha's path was just determined. And he needs to keep fighting to absolve himself of his sins of like putting his sister in that situation and just uh, taking on the mantle of like the Eldians. And he needs to follow through. And finally, Kruger tells him that all nine Titans have names and that his Titan has always fought for freedom. It's known as Shingeki no Kyojin or the Attack Titan. Oh, my God. Um, (sighs) (laughs) I want to know what all the other Titans names are. I mean, is it actually just like the Beast Titan? Is that the name of the Titan or does it have another name? You know, Hmm. stuff like that. The Colossal Titan, etc. Right. Back in the present. Aaron is speaking this name out loud, the Attack Titan. And then we have this, like, moment to lighten the mood where, like, Han shows up outside the cell and is like, did he just, like, 
say the attack titan to himself? Yeah, I think he like lifted his hand to his chin and then just said it. And then Levi's like, you know, he's 15 years old. He's going through a phase. It's something everybody goes through. (laughs) (laughs) I love how they keep doing that this episode. They're like, it's a phase. And you're just like, what? And And everybody believes it because Aaron is such an idiot. They're just like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's totally believable because think about Aaron's character up to this point. Of course he's going through a phase. Um, and so they... Guys, this is not playtime. Stop it. Oh. No, this is not wrestling hour. Cats animals are wrestling in wrestling. the background. You can probably hear her jumping onto the couch over and over like a fucking... <laughs> I hear her collar that she forgot yeah, to take off. No. Shaking around. She literally just jumps onto the couch like buoys herself off of it and like soars into the air and then just <laughs> what do you goes think this circles. is the red leaf retro podcast <laughs> <laughs> i should like film it one day one of our on uh, co-podcasts on anime radical <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh yeah. well while while cats animals wrestle it's fine so they release Aaron and Armin and Mikasa from their cells a bit early because it looks bad to jail the heroes who just defeated the Colossal Titan. Uh, especially when Hanj is like, you know, me and Levi are the idiots idiots who just allowed the armored and beast titans to escape as well. We <laughs> can't really hold this against you. Um, All right. And Aaron sees Mikasa outside the cell and is like, yo, you uh, lost some weight there. You look like crap. And she's just really distraught about how she's going to lose her beloved Aaron in eight years. Uh, so we got eight Army. years to fuck him. No! <laughs> Let's be honest. Mikasa's probably going to die long before that. It's like the right things are going. Um, anywho, Historia has come to trust. And she has been given Emir's love letter. Uh, which we see him here writing in a flashback and Reiner's like standing right next to her, like watching her write it. And like, so the beginning of the letter is just like, yeah, Reiner's watching me write this letter. He's being a real creep. I can see why he's a single bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what happened um, to uh, her? I don't remember. Emir? Uh, well, she's writing now that she doesn't have much time left. So I assume she's near the end of her 13 years yeah, as a Titan. And she's about to, to, to pass away. Um, no, so no. that's why she's writing this letter, Historia. No, it's the um, power that gives you the 13 years, right? Yeah, which well, she yeah, has. Well, yeah, it cuts your lifespan What was her short? power? And she's been a Titan for a while. Uh, I don't know which Titan she was, but I think she is one of those nine Titans. So I'm not sure what yeah, the power She never showed is. a specific power, so I don't know. I don't know. I guess that's well, a little unclear. I mean, yeah. hmm. If you're not one of the powered Titans, then you're just mindless. Yeah, so I mean, she, she can turn back into a human and everything, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and she says, like, I have no regrets, even though I don't have much time left. I have, actually, never mind, I have one regret, and that's that I wasn't able to marry you, Historia. Oh, so cute. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. Then, so his, this is the weird thing that happens. Historia touches her hand to the letter, and she sees, like, a titan flash of Emir's memories. Yeah. And we hear this narration of Aaron about the coordinate and how it connects everyone. And then in the immediate conversation afterwards, it's hinted that maybe there was a secret message hidden in this letter from Emir directly to Historia. But, but Historia is just like, I don't know what the fuck that was. That was weird. <laughs> Do you guys have any theories about what that was? Like, wh- did that tell Historia something that she needed to know? I'm not, I'm not sure, really. I was more concerned on how it fucking worked. What, was this some kind of weird Titan magic? I think so, yeah. Maybe that's her power, Leo. Maybe maybe because Historia is a, uh, what they call her, a royal or something like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was actually unintentional of Ymir, but because she's a, Historia is a, a royal, that it somehow allowed her to read that. That that's a good theory, actually. I like that. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so then there's this meeting of like the scouts and like the military government or whatever, where the, oh, yes. <laughs> the three books that were found in the basement are presented. Uh, and Hanj basically breaks down what they say and explains that the Eldians are now at war with the entire world, not just the Titans like they thought they were. Um, and Kruger had explained to Grisha that the king who possessed the founding Titan had refused to fight and wiped all his people's memories of any of their kind beyond the walls. 
And eventually, Grisha was able to take the Founding Titans' powers in the past, and then he passed them on to Aaron. Uh, and so the full power of the t- Founding Titan can only be wielded by someone with royal blood, as we know. So but- Historia has to eat Aaron. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, so the royals yeah. have their power like restricted by the king's ideals, right? Like We've seen that in the past, that uh, even when they get the power of that titan, they can't do anything because the king's ideals are so strong about not fighting that they haven't been able to wield the power of the coordinate. Yet, Aaron somehow was able to wield it briefly, even though he doesn't have royal blood as far as we know. Uh, so maybe he can utilize that power. However, Aaron realizes like the one moment where it felt like everything connected was when he came into contact with the smiling titan, Dina Fritz's titan, who had royal blood. And so he stands up and, like, yells in the middle of the room. And Hans, like, looks, <laughs> Hans looks back at him and is like, oh, right. And then he turns back to, like, the military governorship. And he's like, he's going through a 15-year-old thing. <laughs> 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 it was such a good moment. I think he, she would have had a, a better chance if she had been like, he's been through some shit. And then all you can do is go, Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much anything you do, we go. He has Tourette's. Mm. Forgive him. <laughs> it's it's funny, and then they all accept it, of course. Like we said, and Aaron just sits back down. And he decides not to tell anybody about this revelation because the only royal he knows of who could be made into a titan to touch him is Historia, and he's afraid of what the military will do to her if they find that out. I mean, I assume they would turn her into a titan. Yeah, <laughs> but which one? Like, I mean. I don't know. Yeah, like, anyway. Uh, In one final flashback, Kruger tells Grisha that he must build a family inside the walls and love them, or else the same mistakes will just be repeated over and over. And he must do this to save Mikasa and Armin. Yeah. And and then he says, like, I guess I have memories of the future or something. I wonder whose memories those are. (laughs) And I'm sitting here going... Are we going to put time travel in Attack on Titan now? Because this is <laughs> fucking weird. But, like, that goes back to, like, how, like, they're all connected somehow. Mm-hmm. As I think was actually what that's probably referencing. But it's just like, what? <sighs> yeah. And it also begs the question whether one of the nine Titans has pow- a power to envision the future. Uh, and he's somehow connected to that. Uh but yeah, it's a yeah. That's that's a weird thing. That's a weird thing to just throw out there. <laughs> it's just very mysterious. I don't know what the fuck that means. Um, I don't know either. It's funny that he doesn't say to save Aaron though. He just says to save Mikasa and Armin. So maybe Aaron is going to have to sacrifice well, himself. It would be like a memory from Aaron himself, and that's why it would make sense. I guess that's true. Yeah, since Aaron has now. Uh, absorbed the power of the attack titan and the founding titan so maybe the attack titan is able to communicate through time and space back to kruger but we're and, all connected uh, in one area <laughs> <laughs> that's some fucking hippy dippy shit is what that it was something I, it was something like it was harder to explain than jojo was this week like what the fuck <laughs> I think I finished so, JoJo and had a better understanding of what happened than this episode. And I was like, why does that work like that? I don't, whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I wonder, like, what's going to happen next? Because, like, you have the Beast Titan, you have the Armored Titan, and then you know now that all of the mainland is, like, attacking them in some way or another. Do you think they're going to, like, leave beyond the walls? Well, I, I assume they have to deal with the Beast Titan and the Armored Titan first, but I was wondering if, like, they're going to launch an attack on the mainland or something, or, like, a rescue operation to save, like, the Eldians that might still be there. I mean, I wonder where it goes from here. Like, how, where does this war go? And how long can Eren keep this secret about, you know, being able to wield the power of the coordinate from Historia? Because she obviously is going to have to make a decision at some point. Uh, was there also news that uh, season four is coming out in it is. fall 2020? And it's the final season, yeah. too. That's what they said. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to wrap this up. I guess we'll see. 
Yeah, I don't know how long the season's going to be, but yeah, it's apparently slated really, if to anything, start. Between these last yeah. two episodes, I feel like they opened it up to like they could go on for fucking ever <laughs> if they wanted yeah. to now since we're involving the whole fucking world. <laughs> nah, they'll wrap it up real quick. It'll be nice and easy. Uh, Aaron will take a helicopter over there and uh, kill all the Marleys. And it'll be good. It'll be over. <laughs> oh, man. Sure. You know what I wish would end really quickly? <laughs> Oh, is One Punch Man God, season two? I'm so tired of fucking One Punch Man. <laughs> there, I feel like this I'm episode so was a lot better. Like they actually did Bro, it, a bunch it, it more was fighting. Better. And it was I actually mean, animated better than it has it been was so animated long. Okay, yeah, I agree. It, relatively, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Rel- so relatively, like, yeah. Episode eleven of One Punch Man, or twenty three, depending on how you want to slice it. The varieties of pride. So. It starts out with Garo fighting all of those A class heroes. Um, Fucking noobs. There's, I know. <laughs> there's apparently some resentment here from A class heroes towards S class heroes. They have this like thing where they're kind of they're thinking to themselves, you know, we're gonna take down Garo and he's taking down all these S class heroes, and then we're gonna be what, the what's badass his name? Like bitches. Death machine the, gun the, or something. Death Gatling. Yeah. yeah. Death Gatling. Get, yeah, well, his Gatling big thing gun. was like he feels like the system doesn't work right, and the A class heroes are underappreciated from the <laughs> S class heroes. Like the S class heroes get paid more and stuff like that. But he's like saying, you know, we're just as good as they are. But like but the I system's like broken like Gatling, or whatever. Yeah. Gatling gun guy or whatever the fuck is one of those dudes that. As soon as he becomes an S class hero, he's he's gonna immediately change his stance on that. Probably, <laughs> he'll, he'll be like, you know, I, I'm better than all of you, and I deserve the better pay, and blah blah blah. It's really just about him being bitter as fuck. That's exactly. what this is. This whole part of this episode, I just felt like these class A heroes were just being whiny bitches, and I just like I was thinking about them as if they were minor league baseball yeah, players. I didn't like your analogy at all. I'm sorry, Become. <laughs> I mean, like, minor league baseball is also a professional league. It's just a lower class of league than major league baseball where the S-class players play. And you know what? They are better than the A-class players. (laughs) They just (laughs) are. And that's the way things are. These guys need to accept it. And, like, yeah, you can get promoted to S-class if you show that you have the potential and the strength to, like, Well, that's when he also brought up the point. He's like, the system doesn't work correctly. It doesn't recognize people that could possibly be S-class heroes. I mean, like, you, I feel like in this world, you have to force that recognition through strength and ability. There's a shit ton of heroes. Like, yeah. if you want to, this is a lot like My Hero Academia in that way. Like, if you want to do something, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, you're getting paid. You're probably not <laughs> struggling to put food on the table. If you are, maybe you have a slight point. But even then, it's like, just stop being a whiny bitch. Class A heroes need a union. They need a union to (laughs) negotiate. I don't know. With the hero association. There's just a lot of there's a lot of resentment and not a lot of like heroic feelings here. Let's put it that way. Sure. Um But yeah, and so they're fighting him and they want to take him down to be like, look what we did. Um I don't know. At one point during this fight, Garo makes this point where he goes. This is just all of these heroes are just steps on my path to become a true monster. And I'm like, what does that even mean, Garo? What does that mean? I I don't understand. He wants to be a monster. He wants to be the monster (laughs) that wins. But I don't know. He's weird. He so like and it has a flashback of him rooting for Crab Demon when he's a kid, which is like the villain of that he was comic. only trying to stop pollution <laughs> cat he's trying Come to on. protect the oceans yeah he did try to protect the egg and women. yeah <laughs> he yeah. was captain planet but he was viewed as the bad guy he was a hero. i mean all of this shit goes by the wayside when you realize that garo has killed how many fucking people now it's not not so cute and rainbowy at that point is it well, you no. assume he's killed people i don't know all There's those people no were I mean, up they, they, in the oceans, I think. So uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> they kept throwing their batteries into the oceans. He had to stop yeah, that shit. Sons of bitches. But yeah, they, they decide to kill uh, Garo, the, all the heroes at this point, because they are having trouble getting him. Like they they keep trying to like kind of gang up on him, but he's avoiding them. Um, at one point, one of them, he Garo is like, "Fight me by myself," and Stinger's like, "Okay." <laughs> and then he gets taken out, and and all the other guys 
she's like, what the fuck? And I'm just like, why are you so stupid? <laughs> I think he, I think Gara must have read in that hero book that Stinger is stupid. Take advantage <laughs> of this. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, and then the, what, is it Stinger? Or which one is, is the one that has a random flashback about getting saved by Saitama? It's the dude in the tracksuit. Oh, he tracksuit guy. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember what his name is. Guy, I don't think he got could, a name. All I could think of with him, because he's all he does is wear a tracksuit. All I could think of was Kim Jong um Oon Un. or whatever. Because he wears the fucking tracksuits all the time. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? A a dictator themed hero? Um <laughs> I don't think that's what they're going for, but I like that's the connection you made. <laughs> but I don't know. And then the Gatling guy. He's like sh- he he hits him with this like final move or whatever, and it's it's like a you know machine gun blast. It's like he turns, blast. His head turns into a skull, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Um, I, I mean, it doesn't work. Garo's <laughs> just like fuck you. Well, Garo is also saving here, the though. kid in the yeah, shed. Yeah, he's by like, there's doing a kid. It. He's like, there's a kid over here though. So like, you should stop. And and that he doesn't stop. And he's like, I don't care about that. Um, and then. Apparently, though, that guy, the tracksuit, Kim Jong-un hero dude, <laughs> um, he he called Saitama for help because he's at least not, doesn't have an ego. So someone didn't he called have a the fucking S-class ego about it. for help. Yeah. He like, did he, the he right actually, thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Genos comes um, because they called. And then, <laughs> meanwhile, King is destroying Saitama like a fuck ton <laughs> at video games. I like um, how he's playing like this like little tiny character and Saitama's like this huge character who you would think is stronger, but of course he loses anyway. Yeah. And it's like a cutesy character too, like <laughs> <laughs> infuriating. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. Eventually he gets worried about Genos and decides to go take a look at what's going on. Um I don't know. And then and then I find out like um Garo starts mimicking that creepy dog guy. And I'm <laughs> dog like, here. what the fuck is this? Stop referencing the weird dog guy. <laughs> you mean the ultimate like hero of Japan? The dog guy? <laughs> uh, I hate him. He's so good. Uh, he's the weirdest fucking thing he's ever. He's done nothing. Uh, Why do you hate him? Because <laughs> he's bizarre. A grown man should not act like a dog. Okay? <laughs> um. Anyway... I don't know. And then Genesis is like, we don't have time to waste on newbies like you or no or nobody's like you. And this pisses Garo off. And and then his hair turns red and his eye turns red for no fucking reason. I, I couldn't understand why it happened. Did they explain it? I don't think so. Just oh, he's getting like choked out by Genesis' arm and then like the tree oh. falls over. It was sometime in that. So, yeah, so like because he got choked out, his hair turned red. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. He's turning into a monster cat. Come on, keep up. No, he didn't eat one of those stupid things. He's turning into he his own monster. Into a... He doesn't need a fucking monster pear this heart. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. Cat, what's the company and, and... that makes like all the good hair dyes? Is it, like L'Oreal or whatever? Like Uh-huh. <laughs> you think there was like uh-huh. some hidden in like a little hole in the tree and he just like took it out there when the fruit tree fell down? He's like, I'm dying my hair red. Right and no now. one comments on it either. No one's like, why did your hair turn colors in the middle of the bat? Are we in Dragon Ball Z? What's happening? <laughs> no, no one says shit. Um, yeah, just like in Ma- Dragon Ball Z, I I'm feel like it's supposed to send some type of power up from him. Yeah, it's of course. I don't know. It's, Makes it's sense. weird, though. And then the it's weird that no one comments on it and no one said, yeah. Anyway. Are you the just Monster upset Association. he didn't yell for 20 minutes before he finally powered up? <laughs> If you're gonna change someone's hair, you should probably make there be a reason why their hair <laughs> changed color. You shouldn't just do it. You should be like, oh, he's powered up now, or like, oh, something happened. Not just randomly, we decided to change his hair in the middle of the fight. That's all. All right. And then the Monster Association dude shows up and is like, we're offering you an executive position. And and he's like, no, thanks. And he's like, well, I'm going to force you. And then Genos is like, I've got your back, bro. Even though we were just fighting and kills him, um, kills the Monster Association guy. And then just as Genos is about to kill Garo, Bang Sensei and his brother show up and they're like, we're going to handle this instead. And so then they start whooping him. And then you get a flashback of Garo as a kid showing up hungry on Bang's door. And he's like, are you strong? And Bang is like, oh, and then. Garo apparently collapsed 
So I don't know. Once again, they try to make us feel sorry for the serial yeah, killer. Exactly. I don't know. That, that scene didn't work for me at all. Like that flashback, especially with the transition back to like the fight music when it came back from it, it was supposed to be like an emotional moment where we felt that they had a connection once, but now they're fighting each other. Oh no. But it didn't, it didn't work at all. Cause this show just, it doesn't have the power to do that. Cause it hasn't set anything up really. And it's just like, Felt felt so flat. I was just so nonplussed by that whole exchange. Anyway. Oh uh, yeah. Did it I ever was... tell you guys I yeah. did grow up with a guy who's my friend in elementary school who did sympathize with the bad guys in TV shows? I think you mentioned that. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah so like <laughs> when I see this, I'm like, I've actually seen this in real life. So like it's like totally believable to me. Because mm-hmm. I've literally seen this. I'm like, because I know it can happen, but... <laughs> uh, did he become a murdering serial killer in the... <laughs> you know, I lost track of what he was doing uh, right after high school ended. Mm. and But before then, he was... He really hated gay people. Oh, great. And <laughs> there, oh, there are actually pipe bombs in the bottom of his parents' pond. They had to throw away when he got investigated. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> God he, damn. he literally is like Kara. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. That's scary. That's a thing that's I know. Good. I've never told anybody that, but I feel like it's fine now. That's been two. Jam. Graduated in 2005. I mean, it's been at well. least it was just your friend. I once dated a guy in high school who threatened to blow up my entire school. Mm-hmm. And the police had to come in and, and like. March him out in front of everyone. Cat was like, oh, I really don't feel like going to school today. And her boyfriend was like, Well, I can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, we shouldn't uh, laugh about this. I know, no, it's terrible. No, I mean, yeah. Yeah, if, uh, you can now. It's been decades. You can laugh. And about it, so, so, like, I get why, like, Garo sounds like such an unbelievable character to you, but I'm like, Actually, he's one of the guys in the show that, like, I've seen in real life a little bit, so... But also, maybe it's a warning sign if your kids or kids that you know start identifying with the villains in superhero movies. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe uh, think about that I wish I could bit. remember specifically what... He did reference a specific show, but I don't remember anymore. It's been hmm. way too long. Hmm. I hope it was Captain Planet. <laughs> uh, I don't think it was. <laughs> oh, all right. Leo, are you ready to connect? I'm ready to end this show because Oof. it's the final freaking episode. Leo's trying to delete his connections from everyone else. That's what he's trying to do. Oh, Leo. <laughs> but we're going to save him from himself. We're going to go back in time and save Leo before he shuts so, his so, heart off to Sarah's on my. So who am I? Am I Toei in this? Who keeps trying yeah, to you're Toei. <laughs> <laughs> you are. And me and Kat are Enta and Kazuki. Yeah, we're but going who's back. who? <laughs> uh, mm. hmm, I guess I'm Enta, probably Cat's Kazuki. Let's let's yeah. be honest. So you have an unhealthy fascination with Cat. <laughs> I mean, I'm wearing glasses right now. That, All right, we'll sense. go by because you have glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so episode eleven. This is the final episode of Sara Zanma. It is a shorter season. I want to connect. <sighs> so Sara Zanma. Sara 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 Zanma. Okay. Anyway. So, we pick up where we left off with Toei being absorbed into Dark Kepi. Uh, and his brother Chikai is there and explains to him how he's now seen a vision of himself from a few moments earlier. And in order to get outside of the circle of society to the place where there are no connections, he must break the remaining connections that he has by shooting his past self. And so, he begins shooting images of his past self. As Kepi, Kazuki, and Enta try to race after him and stop him from erasing everything. And it's Shikai like is yeah, Dark oh, Link what? from Zelda. <laughs> he is kind of like Dark Link. And his gun is like imbued with this dark power that we later figure out is Dark Kepi, um, which is like allowing him to do this. And so Chikai is egging Toei on, saying he'll never have been hurt if he erases what happened to begin with. And Kazuki realizes that the final stopping point is going to be the bridge four years ago when Toei gave him that Masanga bracelet uh, where they first connected to each other. So they're attacked by the otter who launches this like red liquid at them and they start like drowning. And Kepi turns around and in one last moment of butt stuff farts out a bubble so they can like <laughs> in breathe. In one last moment of butt stuff. <laughs> 
I mean, like, you gotta He's be. He's not wrong. Uh, like, there's <laughs> been a mean... lot less butt stuff as the show has gone on. Honestly, it's been like uh... one thing an episode, maybe at most. And so this was like a nice last hurrah for like. It was ridiculous. I'm like, fart. are they really breathing in <laughs> fart juice? Is that what they're doing right now? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Cappy's like, I'm gonna stay behind and take care of this otter. And the otter talks down to Kepi for trying to lecture it while Kepi was so hopeless at one point that he cut away half of himself to get a, get rid of his despair. Uh, and the otter tells him to um, embrace the otter despair I'm about to give you. So Toei reaches the Azumabashi Bridge from four years ago where he dropped the soccer ball into the, the water, giving up on his dream and desire there. And his brother hugged him after they lo- lost their parents. And Toei decides to cut off his connection with his brother now, uh, since he's like chosen this for himself. And he shoots Chikai. And as Chikai kind of like falls away in a cloud of money, uh, he turns into an otter. So it was like an otter inhabiting Chikai and egging Toei on to do all this. So Toei t- takes aim at his past self, but just as he fires, Enta tackles him, and Kazuki gets in the way, and the bullet kind of cuts through the Masanga bracelet that's on his ankle. Uh, and it turns out, like I said, that the gun Toy was holding was imbued with tar- Dark Kepi's energy, and it, like, takes control of the gun and shoots Toei's past self of its own accord. And so Kazuki tells Toei, I'm not going to get let go of our connection. Even if I'm cut off, I'll keep reconnecting with you over and over as long as it takes. Uh, and Toei is kind of like, almost like reached by this he like kind of like takes a breath and dark kepi sends all three kids plunging towards the abyss of no connections and they slowly begin to have their memories like wiped away but as they're forgetting they're also reflecting on the things that they do remember the things that they figured out and so kazuki thinks about how stubbornly he felt that he wasn't connected to anyone and how he had no place to belong but how he realizes he was wrong about that and he did connect finally and he wants to maintain that. Anta thinks about how he needed somebody to wake him up from his like delusional fantasies. And he's happy that he finally faced that. And Toei thinks about how he felt that his past actions, like where he shot that guy, made him deserve to die and lose all of his connections. Yet all three of them found a connection with each other. And they all realize that they just don't want it to be taken away. They want to maintain it. And so they all start yelling, Sarah, and Kepi, <laughs> Kepi turns them into a kappa for one oh. final Sarah's on my sequence. Um, they need to deliver the Masanga to final Kazuki's being past the, self. Uh, point. Final. Uh, to deliver it to Kazuki's past self from four years ago while Dark Tepi, Kepi is attempting to stop them. Um, the guys are singing about taking back their connection while Kepi attempts to reconnect with his despair and fuse into his original self. And one of the funniest moments in the sequence is like the otter breaks into the song and he just sings, I am an abstract concept. (laughs) Oh, I know. What the fuck was this? I I was like, what? Why are they making it so obvious? (laughs) I think that was Ukuhara kind of like both poking fun at the audience and at himself and his own works because... Obviously, it's an abstract concept. We all know that. Like, it's ridiculous. I'm an abstract. Imagine a villain in like a regular anime just coming across the screen and being like, "I am an abstract concept." <laughs> it was hilarious. I laughed for a good like couple minutes after seeing that. Oh. Um, and at one point, the guys are like trying to find Kazuki's past self, and it's too dark. And they they they're like, "I can't see." And then Rayo and Mabu's like uh, like keychains or whatever that were intertwined like come back to life, and they reemerge and they're like burning through the sky like a comet, telling them like don't let go of your past desires or don't get love just let go of your desires, and they light the path to Kazuki, and the otter. Oh, wait, sorry, I skipped a second. So they're able to deliver the Masanga to past Kazuki, and Kepi at this moment fuses back into one bean, and the otter is defeated, and his last line is just, I am otter. I am a concept. Goodbye. You otter, yeah. you otter believe it. <laughs> oh my god, I just died. I was like, what is this? 
he's just punning all the way to his end and it's the best it's so funny um Kepi who has now refused and is a totally or sorry he's refused himself and he is now a totally gorgeous bishi kappa boy uh tells them to pass over the river of desire one last time and that's when i think the strongest moment in this episode starts because you go into the leaking information sequence and it's like this one long, gorgeous sequence of animation that's interspersed with like the episode titles we've had up to this point. And it's showing all of this imagery of like the guys in what is said afterwards by Sara Asuma is like a possible future that could have happened for them based on their past. Um and it's like they're playing soccer together, right? And so they're running down the field the whole time, but it's interspersed with these moments where it shows you that like these guys still are flawed people and they it's not going to be easy for them to maintain their connections like Kazuki gets a leg injury while he's playing soccer and he has to go through rehab and a lot of suffering to get through it and Toei spends time in like a jail cell presumably because of the things he did with his brother and other bad decisions he made Enta is crying on a bridge probably because he faced the fact that his fantasies weren't reality when it came to Kazuki and he had to deal with that actually and you see them sort of falling apart as teammates and yelling that they'd never want to see each other again and all this stuff but even so in the end they make the final pass to Kazuki and he kicks a goal in the top left shelf in the soccer field. And so they actually do manage to connect, even though they are imperfect, even though they are not all right for each other and they aren't perfect, like pegs in a round hole, they find a way to connect. And it was, it was a really strong sequence. Uh, and afterwards, it was, but I yeah. was like, what the fuck is this? Like, and yeah, I guess they explain it could be like a possible future or whatever, but yeah. I just didn't understand why that, that like what, I mean, it's it makes sense with the whole like soccer metaphor of the show, but it is weird that yeah we saw one possible future for them and not like their actual future. Yeah, yeah. like I figured they would. I don't know. It's weird. But we do get more of that at the end of the show. So now recrowned, we see Princess Sara Azuma and Prince Kepi uh, telling Haruka that like only those who connect their desires through the pain of loss can take the future in their hands. Okay, but wait, wait. Are you going to like talk about what they look like now that they're recrowned? Yeah, they're like these like beautiful Kappa <laughs> people with tails, and they're all bishy. And... I don't even know what to explain what they look like is. They don't look like frogs anymore. I read that like uh, also when like Sara is being crowned queen, uh, it's by Rayo and Mabu, and it's like a recreation of like a Rubens painting, painting like the ador- Adoration of the Virgin Mary or some, something like that. Some painting like that. I don't know the exact title, sorry. Um, and so they're just like recreating that. And it's, yeah, it's weird how they just look like these princely royal people now. They look like little ponies or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they look like almost like Mewtwo or something like Pokemon. It's ridiculous. Um, and so Haruka realizes then at the end here that having people that you're connected to is what leads to sadness and happiness, but he's going to believe in the choices that he makes and the connections he makes with people and that those connections will make life worthwhile. So that is like sort of the end of Haruka's arc. Uh, and then we see that the real future Toei does indeed go to like juvenile detention. This is like a montage that goes oh, it on. shows him getting his hair shaved off, yeah. and then they bow, which I was like, they bow? Okay. And it's kind of just like this kind of sort of depressing sequence where he just has to face what he did for three years. He's in jail for three years, uh, and he gets released, and officers like, this is the first day of your new life. I don't want to see you back here. He catches a bus back into town, and he's alone. There's nobody to like meet him outside of the jail, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, and he, I liked how he was walking through like that main square where you usually would see Sara Azuma doing her thing on the television screen. And instead there's now like a frog mascot. I like that the, yeah. the cap, the cap has finally got replaced by frogs, especially when <laughs> Kepi was like, always like, I'm not a frog. Damn it. You always get pissed by that. Uh, and so, however, he like thinks nothing's really wrong with his old life, not coming back. And he 
jumps off the Azamabashi bridge. This is Toei into the water below and he starts to sink and you're like, man, this is really depressing. But then you see two more splashes and it's Kazuma and Enta who are like, welcome back, bro. And then they all start like running around the bridge and kicking a soccer ball and singing Sarazan Mai. And Leo is relieved because the show is over. <laughs> yes, definitely. So, yeah, I mean, like, I think it, it did a pretty decent job in bringing its themes together for the last episode. I still don't think it like, I don't it think it wasn't perfect. Yeah. I think it could have used another episode, honestly, but I liked it still a lot. And I'm going to be looking for some keychains of some of these characters. <laughs> today, like, I think it was like a really like joyful kind of celebration of like connections between people and like what that means. I don't think it is, like, the most powerful expression of that that I've seen, even in anime, though. And so at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm like, I think this show was pretty solid. I think it was really well directed, and it's, like, a really interesting show to just, like, visually. But story-wise, I feel like it could have come together a bit more. But I also think it's the yeah. type of show that people are going to write essays about for, like, years well, so. I don't think it, the idea is that it's supposed to be story wise great. It, it's, mm-hmm. it's supposed to be more represent representative. Like it's supposed to be more about the themes. Mm-hmm. And, so I, I, I also feel like it could have used more time. I don't. I don't even know if one episode would have been enough. I think it could have used like twelve Two more, or three. like yeah, a, a or twice even as long. 12, even. I mean, yeah. fuck, you could do a lot. Like I don't know. I I always hate it when they make things too short i mean this is the i think this is the shortest show that ikuhara has ever made so i mean he's used to making these long like 39 episode things and it seems like he's getting shorter and shorter shows as he goes along (laughs) well he's probably getting old he's like i can't do this shit anymore (laughs) but uh still like i think it was easily one of the more interesting shows to follow throughout the season so yeah i still think it's hilarious that ikuhara the way he gets shit through it's like well you, you you take out all the weird stuff you pitch it to them that way. <laughs> yeah. Then, then once they've approved of it, then you put it back in. Leo, did you get anything out of this show in the yeah. final episode? No, I legit got really sleepy listening to it just now. Uh, and I would like to do the next show with or without you. Leo. <laughs> Good for you, Leo. I'm glad you really tried. <laughs> and Kat, yeah. you really, you tell you us really about tried Carol to Tuesday. further yourself. All right. Episode 11 of Carol and Tuesday, with or without you. So. With or without you. I don't think she got my joke. (laughs) (laughs) I get it. I'm just choosing to ignore it, just as you chose to ignore the whole fucking season of Sarah's on my asshole. It wasn't that I I chose to ignore it. It was just like when it would be on, I would start off, when it would be on, I would start off going, all right, this is weird, cool, butt stuff. And then by the end, I'm like, Fuck, I missed the last 10 minutes. I don't remember focusing on it. <laughs> so, like, it never grabbed my attention. This show fucking grabs the hell out of my attention. It's amazing. Well, anyway. So, the beginning of this episode, Tuesday's being treated for her burn or whatever. And everyone is trying to figure out what the fuck to do. Because, obviously, they can't go on like they were supposed to right away. Um, and so, the producer it keeps trying to stall for time. And, you know, he keeps looking back at the, the helper off stage, and she keeps shaking her arms like, no, not yet, not yet, so it's not ready. I was trying to figure out what actually burnt her. and like my It's like some sort of steam. I don't know what it was My first either. assumption was dry ice, which would make the, the fog. And it could also burn, but you actually need a decent amount of exposure to, yeah. like, you need, like, 10, I th- I, I, I'm pretty sure 10 plus seconds of, like, solid contact with... Uh, with it to actually create a burn and cause a problem. So, yeah, I don't know what the hell yeah. she did. But yeah, it was something. I, but yeah, so, um, and they keep asking Eric Gunn like questions about himself. Eric yeah. Gunn. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to stall. Well, because they, they know he would go on forever. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny, his uh, quiz answers are like so vapid and empty. It's just like... It's, oh, I know. And they're just like, fuck, this is all we have. We we have to keep asking him things. What's your favorite food, Erdogan? <laughs> yeah. And Erdogan even is like, are you sure you want me to, to tell you this? <laughs> I don't know. And then Angela is like, keeps wondering to herself as she's watching this unfold if someone hasn't done this for her. Yeah. And she's concerned because she doesn't want that. 
she wants to win on her own merits. Um, meanwhile, the girls are in their dressing room frantically trying to figure out what the fuck to do. Um, they decide to sing a song that they haven't practiced a lot, but where um, Tuesday is not going to need to play as much. Yeah, they called had Lost My Way. trouble working the uh, guitar into it, so mm-hmm. they decided to do it without it. Yeah, so at first it seems like Angela's mom maybe did it because Angela is suspicious about it. Um, so Angela goes and makes a comment to her, like, are you hiding something from me? And, I mean, at first, you know, it sounds sort of, she's like, well, I know it doesn't taste good, but the money is good. And so Angela's like, oh, you did do it. But it, it real, really, she's talking about the durian commercial that she had her get into behind her back. How basically. did that one jingle go from Harakana Receive? Where the girl waka, did. Waka, 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 yeah, she there you plays go. <laughs> I knew you would remember that. <laughs> I'll remember that until my dying day. <laughs> That's going to be your last words. You're going to just get, sit up from your deathbed. Waka, waka, waka. <laughs> That's so fucked up. Uh, anyway, they put Tuesday's arm on a sling. I don't know. But probably, and I saw you were like, why would you put your arm in a sling? Probably they just didn't have anything else. No, they bandaged her hand up. Why do you put a burnt hand in a sling? That I guess so she doesn't move it around. I guess the moving it around could like further no, I, I don't aggravate even think the that burns. Would be it. The only thing I could think is so she doesn't accidentally get in the way with her hand like bump it against stuff and like that like yeah yeah that's i don't true <sighs> otherwise it doesn't make yeah. sense to me but yes yeah, so they get on stage one of the judge asks carol how she came from earth as a refugee and carol explains that she's abandoned as a kid she doesn't know if her parents are dead or alive um and she, like the judge asks her like what would you do if you could see them now and she says she would just say i'm here that's such a, like, uh, shitty thing to ask somebody. Like, yeah, I mean, I get it. Like, it's all very cheesy, and mm-hmm. it's something you would want to ask. But, it, I mean, it's a little personal. And it, it seems like Carol just doesn't think about this stuff very much. It, it's not even... Either that, I think she was, yeah, or she's well, come to be, like, I clean with it, just, like, understanding of it. Yeah. She's like, nope, it's a thing. It happened. It's done. It's over with. I'm cool. Yeah, I think that's how she deals with it. I think she's just very truthful about the way she feels, and which is like, yeah. That, that, and her answer makes sense to me because she's like, all right, if they're actually alive and they somehow got lost me accidentally. Mm-hmm. Cool. I'm willing to talk. And that yeah. plays mm-hmm. into her character extremely well. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the song, like, Lost My Way is really pretty. I liked it a lot. Mm-hmm. It's very sad and. Yeah, I liked it. Uh, it's finally another one I like because for a while I was like, oh, no. But no, I really like the song. Um, although, honestly, I thought that Pieter's song was better. Me too. Like, well, it was it really was much upbeat better. and everything like that, yeah. Well, it was much better produced. In my, It just is a better, it's, it has more work put into it than their song. Their song is very rough. Like, it's a good song. It's very well, they, quality. Well, they even said their song was unfinished. Yeah, I was yeah. really interested in the judge's comments here, which I think Kat is going to get into. Yeah, yeah. so Eric Gunn, of course, makes a comment immediately how you, if you can't perform when you're supposed to, that's an issue. And, and I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, it's kind of a bitch move because, like, it's not their fault. They were attacked, but, yeah. like, also. Yeah, but I mean, they were wrong. able to perform. So that's the point. They overcame the obstacle. Yeah, but he did have to stall. But But at the same time, it's like, he has a point, but it's not really their fault. You know, back and forth kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the main judge points out how good Puritor was and says that the girls are really rough around the edges, but their song was beautiful. Um, and I, I think it's interesting. She says, like, really, Pur- Puritor's song is the better one. But if you ask me which one I'd rather listen to again, I would say yours. So I'm going to pass you. And I was very surprised, honestly. I really felt like Puritor deserved to go to the next round. Yeah, but like, she he is the better she the saw artist. the potential and didn't want to halt that progress that they are making right now. Like, I mean, they need the yeah, support now. They, I mean, we will really judge, get it's something not about amazing. Who needs to be supported? It's it's about who you think is the better. Yeah, but you got to think about the show thing. they're on. I I think it was a bad move. I think that was unfair to Pieter. I mean, as annoying as he is when he does his like da da shit, like he worked hard for that, and like he kind of got. Pushed aside, and she acknowledged it and said she just basically said, you know, today's not your day, but don't give up. You definitely have. Like, 
I felt like she's like, you can, you will still make it, but if I shut these girls down now, they might not. And I don't want to, you know, stop the world from not having this awesome creativity from these girls. Yeah, so this is where uh, I come down on this because, like, I think Carol and Tuesday have been continuously sort of being forgiven for their somewhat lackluster compared to other contestants' music by these judges for it being unique. And it, I think where they're starting to come down is that, like, Catherine says, you have like these, this insecurity about you that you're expressing through your music. And it touched my heart. So I think what it's, what they're trying to say is that the imperfections in their songwriting and in their performance are what make them more human and capable of stealing a heart rather than like an AI perfectly produced, perfectly performed song. And for us as listeners, it's, it, that can be difficult to grapple with. Cause I know a lot of people who are watching the show and are saying like, these people are better than Carol and Tuesday. Like, why are they getting through? And the show is trying to make a point uh, that, you know, they're imperfect and therefore more human. And like, that's something yeah, Mars and, hasn't heard. And that like the judges like relate and they can feel it, you know, mm-hmm. better. It Imperfections hits their heart are harder. highlighted though, when people are really good in other areas yeah. and, and Carol and Tuesday does not have that yet. Like in a few years they would right. w- when they are, but th- I mean the, that's what makes imperfections beautiful is that you have this backdrop of things that make it so vibrant against those. And that's why I've kept saying that I, I want to see Carol and Tuesday grow as performers um, and not just stay exactly how they are. But like, uh, oh, what was his name? Skip. When Skip said to them, like, don't lose the thing that makes you who you are, like the thing that drives you, yeah. the thing that makes you want to write your music the way it is. They need to find a way to not lose that part of them while also becoming better and i hope that like through the music by the end of this show that'll be expressed because if it isn't it'll be a bit disappointing um yeah but yeah but yeah so i mean it's it's a disappointing and at least for me because i just don't see that that as being realistic but anyway um one manager has a look of sudden rec- the the one um roddy he he kind of has this look of recognition while he's watching Pirater on the screen um, and he goes back to Pieter's blog where he does all those recordings and he realizes that Cybele was in the corner. Hmm. So he figures out who did it. Um, and of course they, now they have proof too. And meanwhile, um, you know, Gus is thinking that it's Angela's manager. Um, and did, do Angela's manager and Gus know each other somehow? I don't think so. Um, I think cause it, it feels like they have this weird energy between them. Oh really? Like every time they meet up, they they're like, it feels like they have some sort of history or something. But I don't know if. That's oh, you're talking just... about Dahlia, not not Katie, yeah. like her like no, Aaron D- girl. Dahlia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Dahlia Kate, Katie's the manager. Yeah. It, oh yeah, I yeah. guess. But yeah, so, I think they're just two old really. jaded people from the industry, and they just kind of play off they each just, other like that. Yeah, yeah, they just butted heads as soon as they sat down. Too. It's just so <laughs> weird just part it, it always feels like they've known each other for so it does, long. Or something, yeah, but I, it's <laughs> odd. But yeah, so. Uh, but yeah, of course, Gus thinks it was her, but it turns out it wasn't. And she's like, oh, um, <laughs> it was funny. And then Angela's assistant, which I guess is really her manager, but she has no power. Right, yeah. Like, she's a manager in name only. Yeah. <laughs> Managing um, Angela's and, happiness, I guess. Yeah. And you see this like shot of her kind of messing with something, and then Angela comes in and she stops. And like, I kind of think she must be up to something. Yeah, what is she up um, to? I need to figure this out. Yeah. yeah. She seems to be egging Angela on into this rivalry with the girls, in my opinion. And it's like, it, I feel like there's something shady going on. Like, she's doing, I don't know. I don't know what she's doing, but she's doing something. And, and like, Angela, like, turns on her, thinking that, from the description she, she heard, it. that yeah. it's her. Yeah. Yep. Um, but of course she didn't. But I think she really hurts her because she's like, you're not my fan. If you were my fan, you wouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, is a credit to Angela in a way that she wants to win by her own merits. But also she was harsh on her. Yeah. But I also don't think she's unfair in her assessment that something weird is going on with that assistant because she's, she's suspicious. Well, the previous episode, she was staring down her phone as she went to the shower. So, like, we don't yeah. know what she did yet having access to her phone. So we're going to have to wait to find out. Yeah. Cybele is caught and taken away by security and and she like screams and yells at Tuesday. Good for her. her. Cybele's a fucking bitch. I know. And I'm like, (laughs) what do you mean? Like this lady is such a weird, crazy crackpot. I don't know. Yeah. That was, 
the whole Cybele subplot just seems kind of overdramatic for drama's sake. Um, I didn't like it that much, I, I have to say. At the, at the end of the day, if this is her end, I'm just like, ugh, why did we need this? But Yeah. I don't know. Carol points out, like, they go outside and they're sitting on the bench. And um, so Carol points out that the way Tuesday never speaks up is a problem. And she points out that Tuesday isn't really focused very much. Uh, mm-hmm. Dude, I um, love that they address this. Yeah, it's nice. Cause- I, I mean, I, I felt like it, this was becomes like becomes like yes because he's been waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fight, no! fight, 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 fight. <laughs> I was like, no, no. Um, I mean, Carol does have a point that Tuesday is very timid. Yeah, and she easily um, and lets she herself get up. walked over. Yeah, and- yeah. I don't really know what she meant by she's not focused. I do get that she. I think what she really means is she's na- she's naive. Like she's she's kind of. Um, well, I think that, that's things. just a translation thing right there is what that was for the most Could part. Be. Yeah. yeah. She, she's kind of naive, naive about things that um, Carol doesn't have the luxury of being naive about. Right. I think is kind of what she's trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, she has points, but I also don't think she, she was going to like come at her like you were thinking because yeah. she had the gift to like... I, I think this was just her trying to talk with her. It's just voicing um, her frustration with everything that's been going on. Yeah. Yeah. She talks about how Tuesday has um, somewhere to come home to and, and she doesn't. And Tuesday's like, well, but no one really came after me. Like, I know, I know technically I have somewhere to go, but like. Yeah, she said that. But then I thought I was like, well, actually, your brother did under your mom's orders. Well, I think she but means emotionally. Off. Yeah. Yeah, I think what she means is, like, emotionally, no one is connected to her. But, like, neither is for Carol. It's the same way. I, I don't know. I mean, she does have a point, but also you know, both of them have points. Yeah. Um. Suddenly, two men, like, just come out of this car, and they're like, we're here for for you um, Tuesday. And I, I guess it's because she was on the, the show. They Like, her, her mom figured out she's on the show and <laughs> sent people to come get her. I had uh, an interesting from mom. thought about that mm-hmm. because she's... Uh, her mother's technically maybe be the next president of Mars. Like she would be under secret service surveillance. So yeah. like her being as free as she was now is just like insane. That's not how it works. <laughs> I feel yeah. like in reality though, she's not going to be able to take her daughter away like that. She's going to have to let her come back. Cause otherwise it's going to look bad for her that her daughter was on the show and then pulled out. Like she's yeah. going to have to let her come back. And then you talk about politics and you're like, Oh well, this next runner-up for president. What, what's her family doing? And then they find out her daughter ran away, and it's just like, oh, that's a huge fucking deal. Yeah, she, she's yeah. gonna have to let her go back to the the um, contest, but like, be a little have be with the you know with some parameters. I think because there's no way you can just pull her out now. You just can't. It's just gonna be more drama. Yeah, that would be even political. more dramatic. You would think. I yeah. had a really long argument on one of my Discord servers about whether or not it's a plot hole that like people don't recognize uh, uh, Tuesday. Uh, and I think I don't think it's a plot hole that much because like I don't recognize the runner like the democratic candidates. Yeah, kids. yeah, yeah. But mm-hmm. still there you know there are definitely like reporters who do. Yeah, that's and the they thing. Would there, know there probably that. would be somebody who was like following the campaign trail and would familiarize themselves with that candidate's family. And they would immediately go, it would where be- the fuck is your goddamn daughter? That's I been think missing. it would be a plot hole if it continued. They never found out about it, right? Like eventually uh, yeah. it was going to come out. Like I think it, you would have time though. You would feasibly have time. That's where I come back down on it. Like I think up to this point they've given us enough hints that like Tuesday's kind of hidden herself away in the mansion. She dropped out of school because she was a dummy. Uh, <laughs> and then like so it's somewhat realistic that people don't have a good idea of who she is and she's portraying herself as somebody else. But, you know, at this point, now that she's getting, like, kidnapped. And by the way, like, Carol getting, like, backhanded by the security guy. I was like, that's shitty. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. And then, they, then she jumps on the car when, yeah. when they're driving away and then falls off the car and is, like, sobbing on the ground. And that's how the I will say ends. one of the cool like, things Fuck. I noticed when she fell off the car is the way she protected her head with her arms. 
No, yeah, she like, knows what she's doing. I was she's like, like she's that done was this legit. before. That was yeah. legit. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Actually, she probably learned that because of the way she uses that scooter to go around all the time. If she ever falls off, she's probably had to protect her head before uh, in traffic. <laughs> yeah. So that makes I mean, sense. You could say that too. Um, yeah, I love this episode. I'm I'm interested to see what the next episode will be. I'm excited. As always. Yeah, I thought this episode bordered on being over dramatic, but they were trying to bring a whole bunch of plot threads to a head all at once, so I'll forgive it. It'll be interesting to see what happens next. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the drama did get upped this episode. Uh it was still controllable enough for me, so I wasn't really that bothered. Except for Cybelle or Sybil or whatever. She's fucking god damn it. Yeah. Hey, her. I'm curious to see Tuesday's showdown with her mother, I guess, and how that's going to go. And yeah, what her mother even says to her. She, I'm, I'm she needs to like stand up for herself. I just she hope. does. Yeah. And not be too cliche about it. But I have a feeling she's going to get back to that tournament and face off with Angela somehow, some way. So do you think she will win or not? Or are they going to take the loss now and then have the win in the end? Well, what I've been predicting is that. Angela will win, but in a way that she feels like she's lost. Yeah, yeah. I, cause I, I if I they that. win, I'm going to be so angry because it's just not feasible. Mm-hmm. So I would rather them lose because at least it's realistic. Yeah, it's more realistic that way. But I mean, they've gotten enough popularity about out of this anyway, that they're already kind of winners, like to be honest. So we'll see. All right. Uh, that finishes off this week of anime. Uh, we'll be back next week, probably to just finish out the season with episode 12s yeah. and a couple 13s, I think. Or- and then we got something special and secret planned for episode 100. So. We don't even know what it is, but it's special, <laughs> I think, and secret. Special um, and secret. Yeah, just we're going like to do something fun bedroom. for the episode <laughs> 100. Uh, but yeah, until then, uh, thank you for listening. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe to us on YouTube to get updates on new podcasts or videos. You can also find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, basically everywhere, as long as the podcast hosting service is working. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> you struggled. <laughs> oh, I'm glad that's over with. Follow us on Twitter at Nerdum and Other for updates as well. Come hang out on our Discord with the link in the description. Of course, the cat's going to put pictures from uh, AX. The anime. AX, yeah. yeah. Yes, I will. We need updates. Uh, and we also want to see pictures of all of our Discord members' 4th of July celebrations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I hope you all have a happy 4th of July. And with that, we will see you next time. Bye. Yeah. Cool. Bye. Later. Bye.